Good evening. We're live. Uh, this is the Municipal Council agenda for the Town of East Gwillimbury for Tuesday, June 15th, 2021. I'd like to call this meeting to order at this time and ask if there's any declaration of interest. Seeing none, I will move to community announcements. Uh, I have a couple here. Uh, this year, the Junior Firefighter Day was um, done on a virtually, virtually uh, as a poster contest. I was asked to be a judge, which was not an easy task for sure. I'm pleased to extend congratulations to the following top entries. And I believe we have them here to show everyone. There we are. First place, Anthony from City of Richmond Hill. Second place, Sophia from the City of Markham. And third place, Rehanna from the town of East Gwillimbury. Great way for our youth to learn the importance of fire prevention and safety. Congratulations to all the grade three students who participated and there sure were a lot of them. Well done for everyone. Last week I shared with uh, council the announcement that through the natural gas expansion program, East Gwillimbury will be receiving $8 million in provincial funding to deliver natural gas to East Gwillimbury. Partnering with Enbridge Gas over the next 10 years, it's expected this will serve 391 residential properties in addition to 19 commercial, institutional, three agricultural, and nine industrial properties. And as this is our last meeting prior to Canada Day, I want to share the town's plans for celebrations. It's a little different than other years, as we know. This year, East Gwillimbury will be celebrating at the Farmer's Market from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. on July 1st. Our great recreation team has planned many events, uh, entertainment and activities for all ages. It's a great way to celebrate and support our local vendors. Please come out. I'll move to item D, and that is our um, COVID-19 updates. And uh, we have the administrative memo, COVID-19 update 2021-11, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Velchuk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I wasn't sure if the CAO wanted to make some opening comments. Mr. Webster? Thank you. Uh, Deputy Valchich, I usually like to say hello to uh, Madam Mayor, members of council and staff as I uh, haven't had a chance to see folks uh, uh, virtually or uh, in, in person in a little while and members of the public. And uh, we do have a couple of excellent community updates this evening. And on that note, I will pass it over to uh, Deputy Mark Valchich who will see some our pandemic team and uh, recovery initiative as well. So over to you, Mr. Valchich. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Webster and Madam Mayor, uh, through you uh, to uh, yourself, members of council and uh, to the public. Um, this is our COVID um, update for June 15th. As you know, we have these updates um, every two weeks at uh, our council meetings. Um, I do want to let you know that um, because things are changing um, so quickly, uh, this memo was actually updated mid this afternoon. Um, to reflect uh, some changes that came into effect only yesterday. Um, the previous memo that you received on Friday um, had two different paragraphs referencing timing of second dose um, ability to book uh, vaccines and previously uh, prior to uh, April 18th was referenced. That was as of Friday and as of Monday that changed to May 9th. So uh, the current memo that you have is um, current as of today and reflects, reflects the changes that came into effect um, yesterday. So um, as you know uh, or likely are aware, uh, the province has now as of um, last Friday gone into what they're calling step uh, one of their recovery. The um, the, the transition plan uh, for recovery now focuses not on um, the same factors that it did previously, where they were looking at transmission rates and ICU capacity and public health capacity, et cetera, but rather is focusing now on uh, metrics around vaccination rollout. So 
Step one was triggered when the province uh, achieved a 60% uh, milestone for first vaccinations across the province. Um, the second and third step, which would gradually increase uh, both uh, outdoor capacity limits as well as start to um, provide for some indoor activities, uh, will take place no sooner than 21 days uh, between steps. And at the 21 day mark uh, or later, uh, as soon as uh, the next thresholds are hit, then um, then those um, uh, they will continue to reopen. So the next threshold that we'd be looking at would be uh, when they uh, achieve the 70% milestone for first vaccinations. And I believe it is, um, just let me double check, I think it's 20%, yeah, 20% vaccinations across the province for second uh, doses. Um, and speaking of second doses, um, there has been an update. Uh, there's seven uh, health units around the province that have been identified for accelerated uh, ability to book second doses. Uh, York Region is one of those. So as of yesterday, uh, individuals in York Region uh, could start uh, uh, booking second doses. And when we're talking about second doses, they are talking about the mRNA. And uh, for those of you who, uh, we, we just got an acronym there, but that refers to basically the Pfizer and Moderna uh, vaccinations. The AstraZeneca has already uh, had uh, the ability for um, early bookings of second vaccinations that have started previously. Um, I also want to point out that, um, as you recall, uh, a few weeks ago, we had a, a pop-up clinic um, at our sports complex run by uh, the province and uh, Red Cross uh, that administered that. I'm, I'm pleased to uh, report that uh, we are currently in discussions um, with the province and Red Cross uh, around um, a second uh, pop-up, which would extend vaccination uh, opportunities to those looking for second doses. It would be, again, a Moderna uh, vaccine that would be administered, which was the same as the vaccine that was administered at the first pop-up clinic. And um, although we have not uh, finalized it, so I can't give you certainty around uh, timing. Um, I can say that it appears that that will uh, take place sometime in the early part of July and uh, we'll certainly provide you with um, an update as soon as we have confirmation um, for your information. The other thing um, I wanted to mention is um, although um, gypsy moths uh, likely don't relate to COVID, um, we have uh, reference gypsy moths in this COVID update, uh, maybe because the um, uh, we did talk about the farmer's market opening up and, and at one of the significant events at the farmer's market was um, the um, distribution of um, uh, burlap, burlap wrap uh, to assist in sort of uh, protecting trees against the gypsy moths. So I, I did just want to mention that starting today, um, the um, library in Hong Landing was uh, offering uh, burlap to residents that wanted to come in and pick it up. And um, in speaking to the um, CEO of the library uh, just before six o'clock this evening, um, even though they opened at three o'clock this afternoon, they already had over 30 uh, visits from residents coming in to pick up the burlap. So uh, obviously um, a very successful afternoon in terms of the distribution of that to help the residents uh, in East Goulenberry with that issue. So, Madam Mayor, with your permission, I would just ask two other people to make some brief comments. Uh, Mr. Karmazin, first, just to speak to some of the uh, CPRC uh, impacts um, as we have now gone into step one, and then um, we would just get some brief comments from Margot Bejan just in terms of some things that are happening on the uh, business recovery front. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mark, uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, as we safely phase in our reopening plans, um, Community Parks, Rec and Culture has a number of brief updates. Uh, we're pleased that we successfully opened our farmer's market uh, with a record number of attendants and vendors. Uh, some of the initiatives uh, have been referenced in the memo uh, with the support uh, for our residents uh, with the gypsy moth LDD invasive species and we do continue uh, those efforts uh, as we move along. Uh, there was an outreach to our schools to support potential 
graduation ceremonies and we did and we did provide an update on uh, the permitted use of our outdoor facilities including all our sports fields tennis courts and uh, outdoor park amenities uh, brief updates also provided on town events and the potential for town events if permitted in particular music at civic square and movies in the park uh, for late summer early fall and then we also have a planned safe return to summer camps with registration opening tomorrow june 16th and an update for all of our residents and with the assistance from our uh, communication staff in particular danielle vernil uh, our recreation staff have prepared a short return to camp uh, video uh, displaying how to return to camp safely uh, to provide some confidence and to um, put uh, put some parents minds at ease and guardians minds at ease uh, i would ask that uh, clerks maybe play the video it's just a short video two minutes and 30 seconds uh, for council mayor council and the public Welcome back to Summer Camp CG. Although this year will look different, we are excited to provide a fun and safe camp experience for our campers. Let's take a look at what your return to summer camp in EG will look like. Camp drop-offs will be available from 8 to 9 a.m. each day. When you arrive, please physically distance yourself in a line near the camp registration table located at the front doors. Ensure you all have your mask on before approaching the sign-in area. You will be greeted by one of our friendly EG camp counselors. Counselors will conduct a COVID-19 screening with your camper and verify who will be picking up your camper at the end of the day. Prior to your child entering the facility, staff will do a temperature check on each camper. Once given the green light, your camper will be asked to sanitize their hands and will be taken to their designated camp space to start the day. Campers will be spending most of their day outside there will be time spent indoors for some cool down, structured activities and art time. When preparing to come to camp, please remember to include the following items in your child's bag for the day. Nut-free lunch, sunscreen, two to four masks, water bottle, extra clothes, bathing suit for water play, towel, hat, and weather appropriate tire such as rain boots and a jacket. Campers will receive their own camp pack that will stay with them for the entire week. This pack will include things like pencils, coloring supplies, glue, and scissors for their own exclusive use during our creative times. Children will be required to wear their masks outdoor as physical distancing can't always be maintained. Space will be provided to remove their masks outdoors in specific controlled and safe spaces. At the end of the day, parents or guardians can pick up their camper between 4 and 5 p.m. When you arrive at the facility, please go directly to the sign-out table prior to collecting your child. Ensure you are wearing a mask and physically distance yourself outside near our sign-out table. Remember to have your ID ready so staff can verify that you are on our approved pickup list prior to receiving your camper. Camp staff will bring your camper out to the registration table and your sign out will be completed. We look forward to seeing you at our camps this summer. For more information, visit www.eastgwillenbury.ca slash summer camps. Well done. Excellent. I wish I had little ones to go to camp. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, through you, uh, I, I will now pass on the presentation to Margot Vision. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Aaron, and through you, Madam Mayor, good evening, members of council. I uh, just wanted to share with you one of the uh, newest events we're going to be undertaking in, in support of business recovery. It's called the Longest Dinner Table, and it's an industry-led initiative um, that is intended to showcase a restaurant industry that's been so hard hit by the pandemic. Um, we're hoping, and we're working with the Chamber of Commerce in, um, in partnership on this event, which we hope will happen mid-August. We're just uh, at the stage right now where we're pulling together a project team 
uh, of community volunteers and, and chamber members. Uh, essentially what it will be is an opportunity for restaurants to provide uh, a prefix uh, menu for outdoor dining in an, in an atmosphere of celebration um, for the community. We, um, we, we're planning for August because we hope that will align with um, restrictions being loosened and, and the ability for the community to come together. And so over the coming weeks, we're going to be formalizing the plans, reaching out to all of our restaurateurs to see who ha who is interested, and then figuring out uh, the, uh, how to support them in, in this effort. We'll be working with um, uh, it's a province-wide initiative. They'll be showcasing these longest dinner table events throughout the province, and it'll be we'll be able to leverage some of the communication and the advertising that comes uh, uh, through platforms such as Blog To that are seen very widely, and it'll give us an opportunity not only to support our restaurants but also to shine a little light on um, East Gwillimbury. Um, just wanted to mention that even though we call it the longest dinner table, it's not one continuous dinner table. It it will be um, in individual tables respecting um, protocols and COVID distancing, but it will all be hopefully in one outdoor setting. Um, and we're, we're um, ideally looking to locate on Judadone Road um, adjacent to the Civic Centre, which is a nice central spot in the community. So more to come on that, but just wanted to let you know that that's uh, in the works. Sounds like fun. Madam Mayor, that completes our um our, our verbal update of the memo that you've got before you this evening. We're happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Other uh, questions from members of council? Councillor Crothers and Councillor Roy D. Clemente. I'll start there. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, great news about uh, the second dose pop up. Uh, looking forward to, to when we hear about that, uh, an exact date. Um, I had a question when we were talking about the LDD moths. Uh, first of all, I want to thank staff. Um, it's uh, the, the street sweeping uh, is much appreciated by the community. Um, they're asking if there's a way that we can uh, do that every year. Uh, they're really appreciating the increased level of service. It, it's really going a long ways to show that we're uh, doing something to uh, help them with what they're dealing with over there. Um, if you haven't driven through uh, the Tall Pines area, uh, members of council, I, I strongly suggest you take a, a trip through there and just see the devastation. There's a uh, huge 100-year-old tree, 100 old trees that have just been completely defoliated. Um, they're really dealing with a lot over there. So I want to thank uh, staff for everything that they're doing with that, the burlap, the burlap giveaway, all fantastic. Um, I have, I've been getting questions from residents over there about uh, independent co contractors who are spraying and they're concerned with uh, what's being sprayed, whether or not it's legal. And uh, I'm looking for how to advise them uh, with this. If they know the chemical, uh, how do we regulate uh, and who do they go to if they know that there's illegal spraying going on? Yes, go ahead, please, Mr. Carmison. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, uh, anybody who um, is spraying uh, should have a, uh, a license, should be a licensed uh, insecticide sprayer to, to spray the, uh, the chemical um, that, it, uh, that is being dispersed. So uh, the, uh, the ministry, I believe it's the Ministry of Environment, uh, regulates that and uh, uh, they could be requested to provide uh, their accreditation to to, to spray for uh, insecticides. And if they don't, so these people do not have credentials um, and uh, some of them we know what they're spraying, um, but we don't know whether or not it's legal. And the ones who uh, don't have credentials, what can I advise residents to do about that? Who do they call? Uh, the, the best bet would be uh, the, um, the region of York. Uh, they ha okay. they do an invasive species uh, specialist, and they could advise them uh, further to to possibly report to the Ministry of Environment. Uh, that would be my recommendation as uh, back to uh, you know back to residents, and we can certainly we can certainly provide uh, those contact uh, that contact information if needed. Um, if you could just email that to me, I can pass it on to them. That, that's wonderful. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Roy DiClemente. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Just as an advisement, I, my internet is unstable, so if I turn my camera off, I'm still in the meeting, but I'm just trying to preserve some bandwidth. I'm not sure what's happening this evening. Um, my question is just uh, related to the memo. There was a reference earlier that uh, it was updated today. I read the memo before today, so I'm just wondering what's different from uh, the memo I read uh, when the agenda was released and when this was added and what's new today, just so that I have a good sense of that. That is my first question, please, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the question, Councilor Reddy Clemente, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, we didn't add anything. We just deleted the second last paragraph because it spoke to um, second dose uh, uh, registration timing and it had been superseded by information that was up front in the memo that you've got, uh, well, the original memo. So it's basically the original memo with the second last paragraph deleted. It was redundant. Uh, thank you very, very much. Um, through you, Madam Mayor, just to staff, I don't know if you have any poll with the um, uh, with the with the uh, Red Cross and and the province as far as what uh, what vaccine is provided at the uh, at the pop up, uh, I will share that uh, as of this afternoon on the region's website, the only location that was showing any kind of vaccine availability was the Soccer City because they're giving Moderna and everything else is Pfizer and is totally booked up. So um, my my feeling is that there's a greater demand out there for for Pfizer and uh, that we would have greater success, I guess, is where I'm looking at it from. Uh, not at all from the perspective of vaccine shopping, but simply from a perspective of demand and supply uh, for having successful uh, and fully booked pop-up. Thank you very much. Might it be that the timing would be the distance between the, the uh, pop-up that we had in May? Uh, and, and would align for people to come back for the second one. And if that's the case, then I believe it was uh, Moderna that that they gave uh, on the long weekend. So perhaps maybe that's the, the lineup. I'm not sure, but it, it would make some sense if it's the same group coming back again. Madam Mayor, um, we, um, I, I am aware that some clinics are um, stocking both Moderna and Pfizer, and then individuals that are registering are sort of confirming what they had the first shot, and then they're getting their second shot accordingly. Um, it is correct that um, the pop-up clinic that we had a handful of weeks ago was uh, Moderna only. Um, we will uh, be having conversations once um, the pop-up clinic is confirmed. We'll be having conversations again around planning and logistics with both um, Region of York. York Public Health and Red Cross. We can certainly ask the question of them uh, just to indicate if there's any way that, you know, they could sort of expand the offering, if you will. Um, but um, obviously it, it's, um, it's their uh, operation to run, but we will pass along the, uh, the comment. Thank you. Um, Councillor Morton, you had a question? Uh, no, Madam Mayor, not at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor uh, Carruthers, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if there is uh, an opportunity to do a bit of a public uh, information campaign along with the Red Cross, if it's going to be Moderna, uh, if we can let people know that if you had Pfizer for your first shot, you can't have Moderna for your second shot. They are virtually the same uh, vaccine. Um, I, I'm just wondering if we can work with uh, the Red Cross or the the um, uh, a health unit to make sure that we get that message out there. I think there might be some confusion um, and you know, the, the vaccine shopping, no one asks uh, what their flu shot is, right? So I, I can understand, uh, you know, people hesitating between an uh, mRNA and uh, the AstraZeneca, but uh, when, when it comes down to Moderna and Pfizer, it's really splitting hair. So I would hate for people to miss out on getting their second dose at, at our pop-up. Uh, for misinformation. If they have the information and they make the decision, that's fine. But um, I'm hoping that maybe we can work with the Red Cross to get that out there, that if you had Pfizer the first time, you can still get uh, Moderna the second. Thank you. I would hope between uh, the, um, the province and our own uh, regional health unit that they would, would be um, very much involved with with announcing that uh, this one is coming up. So we'll keep an eye on that for sure. Any other questions, comments? 
I'm not seeing any. Thank you very much, staff. Could I have a mover and a seconder for the presentation, please? Councillor Persicini and Councillor Morton, all those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you very much. Now I'm just looking to see. I um, think we are now at deputations. And uh, our first deputant is um, T. Sheyakieti uh, uh, making a deputation to council regarding item P1 and its correspondence uh, dated June 8th, 2021, requesting a noise bylaw exemption to facilitate a wedding taking place on Saturday, August 27th, 2022 at 20170 Young Street from 2 p.m. to 1.30 a.m. And I'm just wondering if our deputant is here please hi there um my name is amanda naylor i'm here with uh, my partner tony Cicchetti, and uh we were here looking for um a noise exemption permit as you mentioned for um august 27th 2022 uh we do realize we are applying you know early for the permit uh to more than typically um but we were informed that there is expected to be some changes to the noise bylaws uh, specifically for noise before 11 p.m. Uh, so this permit would really just dictate whether or not uh, we do plan to proceed with the event uh, as we are looking to start to put some deposits on some of our vendors. Um, so the event is for a wedding. So we're actually hoping to have it in my aunt and uncle's backyard, um, which is located at the address you mentioned at uh, 7170 Young Street in Holland Landing. So they do actually back on to the Holland River, so they don't have any neighbors behind them, and they're very close with their neighbors, two to three doors um, down on either side. Uh, so we do intend to inform them as well of the event, so they are aware in advance. We're looking at a guest list of approximately 80 people, which is primarily made up um, of our family and would also be dependent on whether or not there are any restrictions, uh, COVID restrictions in place at the time of the event. We did include 80 to 90 people in the details of our event just to account for some additional servers as well as other individuals who will be on site as we are hiring a caterer. Um, the caterer we're hiring will also be providing a smart serve certified bartender as we do intend to have alcohol at the event. Uh, so we do intend to apply for a special occasions permit as well as a temporary structure permit separately as we will be having a tent for our reception. Um, we will have a trailer washroom on site with two stalls and running water and then on site parking for all our guests. So we do, there's a stone patio in the backyard. So we're hoping to use that as the dance floor, weather permitting. Uh, so we'll be hiring a DJ and hopefully renting one to two speakers that will also be used by our MC throughout the event. Um, so again, our events on August 27th, 2022, uh, the event itself is gonna be running from 4 p.m. to 1 a.m. Um, but we are looking to apply for the noise exemption from 2 p.m. to 1.30 uh, to account for the arrival of our vendors and then any noise that might result from their cleanup and departure between 1 a.m. and 1.30 a.m. So as I mentioned, we're just applying so early only because of COVID. So many rental companies and vendors are booking up very quickly. And so whether or not you know we're able to kind of proceed with this event uh, will kind of be dependent on whether or not we are approved for the noise exemption. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions from uh, the deputant? Sorry, for the deputant. Any questions? Sounds like a great party. <laughs> we hope so. <laughs> I'm not seeing any questions from members of council. We will be working with staff and we will bring um, a report back uh, at a uh, upcoming meeting. And uh, I, would, I would hope that um, it won't be very long, that's for sure. I have um, our clerk first. Uh, I, I see uh, Councillor Roy DeClement, you may have a question, but uh, Mr. Clerk, go ahead, please. Sorry, Madam Mayor, just to advise, uh, their noise exemption request is uh, has already been uh, paid for and the request is on uh, the agenda as item P1 uh, for council's decision, staff would not write a report back okay. in terms of recommendations. It's it's purely council's decision in accordance with the bylaw. Thank you, thank you thank very you. much. It's been a long time before we've had since we've had one of these. <laughs> Councillor Roy Di Clemente, go ahead, please. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. I was simply going to request uh, uh, or move that we bring item P1 forward so that we could deal with it at this time now that we have the deputant here. I'm glad uh, I'm glad she and her uh, and her fiance were here because I had thought it was for this August the 2021. But, uh, <laughs> They're really looking forward. So, uh, I, as far as I'm concerned, I don't have any, I don't have any issues. It sounds like they've thought of everything, and they're they're doing the very responsible thing of, of coming ahead of time and 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 doing things uh, properly and by the book. So, I'd like to bring it forward, and I'm happy to move that we approve it. Thank you. Thank you. I have a motion to move the item forward. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Crone. All those in favor? That's carried. And we will move to item P. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just going to find it. There we are. Number one uh, on our correspondence for consideration. Do, are there any questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Persicini, Councillor Crothers, and I will read out the uh, the correspondence, be it resolved that correspondence from Teak Chietti dated June 8th, 2021, requesting a noise bylaw exemption to facilitate a wedding taking place on Saturday, August 27th, 2022 at 20170 Young Street from 2 p.m. to 1.30 a.m. be received and that council will grant a noise bylaw exemption from 2 p.m. to 1.30 a.m. to facilitate a wedding on Saturday, August 27, 2022 at 20170 Young Street. Yes, Mr. Clerk, go ahead, please. Sorry, Madam Mayor, if I can just uh, also request uh, to add the receipt of their deputation to this resolution. And um, if it so pleases uh, council, staff were considering adding um, a, an, an additional clause to that, uh, uh, to the granting of the noise exemption. And I can read it out if uh, the deputy clerk can put it up on the screen. So um, following the um, grant the noise exemption between 2 p.m. and 1.30 a.m. Uh, 20170 Young Street, comma, on the basis that no provincial restrictions with respect to gatherings is in place at the time of the wedding. I think that's advisable in, in this situation, given that it's a, a over a year's, out, a, a year's time period out and we don't know what the provincial restrictions may be at that time, but it's a fail safe for council. Thank you. And we hope there are none at all at that point for sure. No, we hope not. <laughs> Councillor Crothers, you had a question. Uh, I just have a little uh, issue with, with the wording of that because uh, it's about any provincial restrictions that apply to the size of their wedding. Uh, if, if you know, there was provincial restrictions on over a hundred people, uh, that would not apply, but uh, how it's worded. Um, so I wonder if respect to this gathering. I can I can imagine a situation where we have some some restrictions, but that aren't applicable to this situation. Just want to make sure that we're careful how we're wording this. I'm fine with that. Other comments? Do I have a mover and a seconder? I do. Thank you. And we're adding in there as well to receive the deputation. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you very much. We hope uh, you have a great wedding and uh, we'll be thinking about you in uh, August 2022. Thank you very much. We appreciate all of your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, with that, I will move back to our agenda. And uh, our next item is presentations. And we have Kay Clark, Giselle and Company, and East Orentia Neighborhood Network making a presentation to council entitled Engaged Inclusive Communities Summary Report. Great to see you ladies here today. Go ahead, please. 
Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of council. Thank you so much for having us. I think this was the best council meeting we could have attended because there was just so much good news and positivity. Um, so it truly is a delight to be here to give you a very quick update on our Engaged Inclusive Communities Project, as Madam Mayor said, the summary report of phase one. Um, quick reminder, the project is a collaborative initiative between Magnus Neighborhood Network Office and the towns of East Gwillimbury, Aurora, and Newmarket. Uh, on that end, I may duck off because we're also presenting to Town of Aurora this evening, and so one of us needs to be in there to log on and do the pre-meeting um, requirements. Um, but that said, this, this project has been a wonderful collaborative initiative. We began uh, and it was approved by this council in late 2019. We formally kicked off the project in March of 2020, which I'm sure will ring bells for all of you because the pandemic, of course, began around that time, which forced us to take a pause. Um, and so the work began in earnest this year in 2021. We, of course, met with all members of council in April and May of this year, where we had the great opportunity to connect and learn more about how you engage within your community. And now today, we're now here to present that final high-level summary report. You have the large report. I think it's about 50 plus pages. So we do hope that you take the time to read through it because Kim will only be able to give you a snapshot. Uh, but we look forward to your feedback and want to thank all council and East Gwillimbury staff for their support um, and supporting the work of inclusive engagement. And with that, I'll turn it to Kim. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you all for the opportunity to present, uh, as Aaron said, at a high level, uh, the report that we um, have before you. Just before starting out, I just wanted to acknowledge, you know, given um, thinking about inclusion and diversity and equity that I think it's important to acknowledge that there's members of our communities that are um, dealing with a lot of grief and trauma and just also acknowledge that um, you know this is one piece of trying to build inclus inclusive communities and belonging but there's really uh, a lot of importance to continue to focus on working on against Islamophobia doing that deep work in anti-racism and uh, reconciliation with our Indigenous communities. And great to have this opportunity to present this um, as one piece of, of that work. So if um, we could just kind of move uh, ahead a slide, that would be great. Um, when we're thinking about this, or do I have, I don't think I have control. So if we could just move forward a slide. This is, this is a quote that I just think positions um, what we're talking about here because we really are talking about how we engage with community in the co broader context of creating inclusion and belonging. And this was a quote that came from a community member in the context of events that we do and some of the decisions that we make of what we're doing and how we're presenting it, the types of foods we're serving, the entertainers that we have can have an impact on how people are feeling welcome. So if you don't eat ha hamburgers, you'll be in an audience, not a participant. And there's nothing wrong with hamburgers. <laughs> it's really just about thinking about the context and thinking about what some of those messages send. Um, if we could just flip forward to the next slide, these are just a few reminders as to why. We can just kind of click through to, um, show the image here, we can click right through. Um, when we took a look at this, it really was that there was a lot of information about what diversity and inclusion in our communities look like at a regional level, but we lacked specific information. And we saw an opportunity to bring our three communities together, people live, work and play, borders are porous, to really see and gain a better understanding of how we engage and how, um, how we understand our communities. Next slide. And again, if we dig into this, um, if we could just click down one more, what we're really looking at is how do we engage more effectively and what does that mean? How does that connect our communities, provide deeper engagement and what opportunity does that lead for growth, economic opportunity and sense of community belonging? And so if we think of that just as a reminder as to why we're doing this, what I'd like to just do is um, take a look at a quote, um, we just moved down, again, speaking a little bit more about what inclusive engages means. And this is thinking about in the broader public engagement and formal public engagement, but really this is about building strong relationships with our communities and capturing those diverse values and perspectives. And if we get that, what it's really leading to is better decision making and policy discussion. So really, the more people we have involved in, in, in providing input and in the decision making process, the better um, the result as well. People feel more part of it and they, they take some ownership. And so 
with this project and moving fo forward a slide here to remind you it came in two phases so the first phase is what we're reporting on here today which is the review and re report and this was having some conversations internally within the municipalities as well as with community partners um, to to get this snapshot um, uh, of, of how we engage, as well as a demographic snapshot, looking at some of the, the, the data out there. The next phase is where we're moving to now that we've got this foundation. And this is how do we take this information and the report and move it into action? How do we start to engage and, 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 and through some workshops with staff, engaging with other institutional partners, neighborhood network partners, and how do we really start to make this um, move to action? If we could move forward. Um, and just as a reminder how we came to this, we did some data digging um, through census data of 2016 and some York Region demographic reports to get that snapshot. We had the conversations and some, some, some engagement sessions with council, and we did some presentation and some engagement with various count, um, committees to gather this information. And what came from that is what is next in the following few slides, which are actually the first part is the demographic snapshot. So this is just to give you a glimpse. There's deeper demographic information um, within, within the report. But if we take a look at this, this is some of the pieces from a visible minority perspective. And what you start to see when you look at the data is it tells two things. It gives you a story, um, but it also starts to just paint, uh, paint a, um, a picture of where the opportunities may lay when we think about some of those demographics. So th these demographic pieces are a really great opportunity to um, dig a little bit deeper and, and use this from a decision-making perspective. Um, there is a lot of depth of information from a dem demographic perspective that this snapshot just scratches the surface, but this gives you an image. And then if we just flip to the next slide, again, this is from a household perspective, taking a look at one other slice of the demographic detail that we gave, proportion of children under 14 living with one parent. Um, again, you just think about the, um, the the picture and the story, but also how that may inform policy. And the demographic snapshot includes um, uh, household income, um, uh, it, uh, visible minority, um, different aspects and different dimensions of diversity, and that's all there in the report. And the second piece to the report is really looking at the themes. If we could flip forward to the next slide. There's six themes and these two are fairly linked and one of them is thinking about meeting people where they are. So as opposed to people coming to us, how do we get out into the community? How do we engage people, whether formally or informally in the community? The second one is how do we do that with intention? So if we are going out to get people's opinion or engage them in a process, how do we think about who might not be at the table, who might not feel included, and how do we actively and proactively do things to engage th with them? If we move to uh, the next slide, we'll see scene, uh, themes three and four. Is it's really important to communicate that commitment, um, and you know some of that is through things that you see, you know the raising of a flag during Pride. Um, those are those are all ways that you communicate the commitment, but it's also in how you um, um, communicate it on an ongoing basis, not just through festivals and different months. If you're speaking to the business community, is there a way to infuse that commitment to inclusion and equity and diversity and inclusive economic development, those, those um, pieces? The, the next one is about making the informal formal. And this is about shifting, you know, the, the, the thinking about inclusion, uh, inclusive engagement as something you think about after the fact and how do you really informalize it and put it and embed it right into all, all of our processes on an ongoing basis. The final two themes, if we uh, just flip forward, one is thinking about access. And this is these are two that came out um, um, in conversation with community organizations as well. Um, it is who's feeling invite, invited and who feels included? And this is both to online, in person, formal and informal. Who's invited to participate in committees and on, um, on task force or or who's invited or encouraged to 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 apply, um, it, it, but also informally, who's being given the opportunity to to go for a coffee or or those sorts of things. So how do we do things to make sure that people are feeling included, and where might some of those barriers be? And then the final one is thinking about how do we engage meaningfully. And an example of this is just again thinking about how do we shift away from engaging with different um, different different communities 
around festivals or around events and thinking about how do we do it on an ongoing ongoing basis in order to build relationships um, and to, to really engage in a meaningful way. And so those are the themes and there's examples, uh, both kind of high level examples and then some specific examples for municip each municipality. And then what we did as well is we took a look at opportunities and I'll just move, ask you to move forward to um, uh, the areas of opportunities. And again, there's a lot of opportunities that are identified, some that are broad and some that are specific. And the first three kind of look at leadership. The first one, who are our leaders? Who are at the decision-making tables and how do we identify them? So thinking about what, what some of those opportunities are. Is there an opportunity to think about how do we develop leaders in our community? Are, are we thinking about what the pipeline of leadership is, whether it's, you know, pipeline of future um, municipal leaders, pipeline of um, future uh, board members for community based organizations? Are we thinking about that? And the next is how, how might municipalities and municipal leaders, um, municipal leadership act as champions and catalysts for change beyond the walls and beyond the, the, the work that you do within our community? And linked to that is where, what are the partnerships that we have? How can we perhaps um, be a catalyst for change with existing partnerships to think of things through an inclusive lens, but also how do we partner with uh, new organizations that are doing some of this important work? If we could just flip forward one more. Um, linked to that is thinking about grassroots organizations and grassroots activities that are happening in our community. How can uh, municipalities and municipal leaders do some work and also organizations like Neighborhood Network um, continue to do work to build capacity with these community organizations to set them up for success. Um, the next one is really thinking about the stories that we share and the stories um, uh, that um, um, are, are put out there um, around the work that we do in community and are there opportunities for the municipalities to amplify um, and prioritize voices that may be underrepresented um, in, in our communities. The next one is about creating um, spaces and opportunities for conversations. One of the um, examples that I, th I think of for this was um, Mayor Haxon, when when you spoke about um, you know, going to the library and kind of having those those chats and, and you're there and inviting people to come to talk to you, creating formally and informally those opportunities for people to to come and, and connect with um, municipal leadership. And then on kind of the tactical pieces, how do we measure, measure success, not just of the inclusive engagement pieces that we're doing, but of engagement overall. And the example that we use there is often for events, it's how many people attend, right? But if we're thinking about, um, you know, creating belonging and creating inclusion, are there other measures of success that we can we can look at versus just the number of people? And finally, are there some collaborative opportunities that we can look at um, for the three municipalities and some community-based organizations to collectively come together and think about these things differently? And finally, in closing, we wanted to just give a um, again a snapshot if we could move forward a slide to take a look at. You know, this is the report, and I encourage you all to take and take a read if you haven't had a chance um, yet. We know that there's there's a lot in there, and really, what that is is it's to give a foundation for this next phase. And this is where we kind of want to see how can we make this drive to action. And so this will happen in a few ways. One of them is going to be working with um, uh, the, the 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 staff on our municipal advisory group for this project to develop and deliver uh, workshops within the municipalities. We'll identify who we'll do the workshops with and we'll identify um, you know, how many, I think it's one to two um, that we will be looking at and um, really drive it towards action around some of those themes and opportunities. We'll also be looking to um, do presentations and find where there's opportunities, perhaps some synergies and collaboration with some institutional partners. So thinking about YRP, the boards of education, perhaps South Lake, how, how do we bring this forward to them? And then thinking about the community level, um, working with neighborhood network to present to partners and workshop with them to think about what is their role and what, is it, what are their opportunities for them to um, take action on some of these themes. And the final piece, which is a, a tactical piece, but has been highly requested, is really thinking about how can we capture a list of organizations within our communities who are doing work around um, creating inclusion and belonging, belonging and diversity and equity and inclusion. And so we're trying to figure out 
with a few tools at our disposal, how might we be able to do that so that there's something easily accessible for municipalities? So that is um, phase two. And if we could just close on a quote that we've used a couple of times, which is coming from the Cities of Migration Project. Um, if we could just move forward to the next slide um, and click through. And really this is just speaking again about the real power that um, diverse and inclusive cities and communities have in creating economic and physical resilience. And I think that, you know, we've had a lot of unforeseen circumstances and challenges during COVID and we can see that how community comes together and where we've been able to do that um, with inclusion, how that's had a really um, incredible impact. So thank you so much for the opportunity um, to, to do this and um, open to um, feedback and questions. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Um, very exciting project for sure. Um, do I have questions from members of council? Uh, Councillor Crone, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you to our presenters. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, detailed presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, I was just curious about the um, the census data that mm -hmm. you were using. That that dates back to. 2016, yeah. I believe. Uh, EG's undergone some mm -hmm. impressive growth since then. How confident are you in those those numbers, or do you expect them to have changed uh, to any degree? I I imagine you'll probably see some significant change. Um, would be my guess, and I think you know it's on the one hand kind of disappointing that we're working with old data, but on the other hand, it creates an opportunity, yeah. right? And I think that that's one of the things that Aaron and I have talked about, that once the new census data comes out, to just do that dive so that we can actually see where the changes have, have come will be really important. Yeah, I, I think having a better a better grip on the, on the data will help with your endeavors. Mm -hmm. but, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. No further questions. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Just a comment, Madam Mayor. Uh, go ahead, uh, Councillor Morton. It certainly um, makes you stop and think about how we can ensure that we're going to be able to be in touch with the people that um, really, really need it. And uh, I have to give uh, credit to uh, the ladies and, and the group that uh, are working this way because um, it, must be a, it must be very difficult for them to um, to really really try and realize how how they have to move ahead with all the different uh, diverse um, areas and um, that sort of thing. So I have to give them credit for that. They're doing an amazing job and have done over the last few years. Thank you, thank you, uh, Councillor Crothers. Go ahead, please. Thank you uh, for this presentation and for the report. Uh, it's really helpful for us to get that snapshot and uh, the feedback uh, that you uh, have been able to gather through all your uh, connections and that. Uh, the Diversity and Inclusion Committee is, is working towards the same goals. Uh, you know, you're talking about COVID, that really shuts down from a lot of stuff that we wanna do. Um, but when you're talking about engaging with festivals, that's sort of the point of the, the community flagpole is that we can hopefully gather can some of these diverse communities out, bring them to, to the flagpole and, and kind of start with those small celebrations that make them feel so included. So I, I really took some of the comments that you said as, yes, we're on the right track. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. I I, uh, I really believe that you've um, you're you're doing very good work for East Gwillimbury and and Newmarket and Aurora. And I find it very interesting that three very different communities. However, in many cases, I know in talking to you and the mayors uh, that we're not much different at all. Mm -hmm. It's it's very similar, and I think we can build on each other's uh, strengths and, and and help people out with with some of their weaknesses as well. There really are no boundaries. Uh, it, there's not a fence up between any of these municipalities. And so while people may choose to live in one municipality uh, over another, when it comes to socializing, shopping, uh, participating in in events, uh, special events, there are no boundaries, uh, particularly through through these three municipalities. So it, I think you've um, cemented that even further for me with with your report that you have and I know that um, we we 
we know this on a regular basis just by meeting people um, uh, on the street, but but I think this is a, a very keen, uh, important point to remember as we as we move along in our community and the and the growth. Every day we have new people moving to East Gwillimbury, and uh, and so do the other municipalities as well. Thank you so much. I'm just going to see if there are any other questions or comments. I'm not seeing. Uh, Councilor Roy Di Clemente, did you have something? I, thank you, Madam Mayor. It was it wasn't important. I just wanted to congratulate Ms. Clark on um, on coining a new word. I know it was I know it wasn't I wasn't planned, but that word belongity <laughs> by <laughs> blending <laughs> belonging and equity together actually was. As, a, as somebody who has a love of the written word, and uh, I, I wanted to I just wanted to recognize that that actually worked for me, uh, oh. even though I know you didn't mean it. But uh, I do wish that uh, I do wish that there had been more up to date census data for, for you to complete this study. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's probably one of the challenges that we, that we're going to have to to look at is how do we make sure that the data that we're using for these sorts of studies uh, is relevant and helpful to us uh, uh, given the, given the significant changes that are happening in our community thanks so much thank you i'm not seeing any other questions or comments councilor roy de clemente would you move that report please thank you and do i have a seconder councilor crone all those in favor and that's carried. Thank you very much, ladies. Really enjoyed your presentation. Always good to see you. Thank you. Very Thank much. you so Thank much you. for all your support. Take care. Bye now. Thank you. Um, our next item on our agenda is corporate services, um, economic development presentation, broadband working group, and a progress update. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, we're um, we're very pleased this evening to. Um, uh, provide this presentation to you and we're delighted to have the chair of the uh, broadband uh, working group with us this evening, Mr. Terry Russell, uh, who's going to be um, playing a big part in the presentation. Um, I also want to thank Councillor Crone as the council liaison uh, to the broadband working group. Um, this group, um, you know, I, I really um, sort of want to commend um, all of the work that they're doing because uh, this is a very important strategic priority for the town. As we know, uh, access to high-speed internet services has become more of a necessity in life rather than a kind of a frill or a, a, an option. Uh, it, it's a necessary service. And this group is, um, the Broadband Working Group uh, is working very hard to facilitate uh, really important discussions and meaningful sort of uh, facilitation to help um, move along uh, implementation of um, broadband access uh, across the town. So uh, with that, and I also want to thank um, uh, Director Beijing, um, our, our uh, Economic Development Director, who's spent a considerable amount of time on this matter and, and supports uh, the committee and will be assisting with the presentation this evening. So at this time, with your permission, I'll turn it over uh, to Margo just to uh, kick things off. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Valtuzin, or you, Madam Mayor, members of council, and members of the public. I'm very pleased to be able to uh, provide an update on our efforts to expand broadband um, to the community. Uh, I'm going to uh, turn it over to the chair of the working group, Mr. Terry Russell, and I'll come back in at the end with a, a few more updates. Um, this is, uh, we, we expect um, things are changing weekly, and so uh, we've got some good news to share this evening and hope to be able to come back in the future with more updates. So uh, without further ado, I'll I'll pass it along to Terry. Thank you, Margo. Um, Madam Mayor, uh, members of council, uh, members of staff, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, what a pleasure it is to, to be with you folks this evening. I've got uh, a short presentation for you, but before I do that, it's so interesting that I was thinking as I was listening to the two young ladies who were presenting uh, their presentation before um, you got to us, all the things that they want to do, we have to have this stuff so you're able to do it. How ironic. So anyway, um, it all goes hand in hand. So in terms of some quick flashpoints, uh, on a very positive note, the uh, Bell application under the Universal Broadband Fund was success successful and it's going to bring high speed um fiber to an additional 44 homes uh, in the Callwood Court area. That was above and beyond 
what uh, Bell anticipated in their original plan. So that's one good step in the right direction. On another area, which I want to draw your attention to, which isn't as good yet, is we're still waiting uh, for the award of the ICON funding. And in particular for us, that means the successful funding of the YorkNet application, so because it'll mean an additional 500 kilometers of fiber installation along all the regional roads and, and additional ISP builds. That's absolutely cr critical. So, and it is because it should allow for much more effective and, achie uh, and achievable internet service provider uh, uh, usage to backhaul through the YorkNet infrastructure and also extend fiber to under service homes uh, in addition. Comment on that. Um, the governments, when I say governments, I mean the feds and the province need to move faster. Uh, it's fine that they talk about all the money that's available, that they're both got a billion plus dollars each to throw around, but we're not seeing it get awarded. Okay. And from my in perspective, that's what is really, really important. For example, the 500 kilometers of fiber installed that we need for YorkNet. So I would urge the town to nudge our MP and our MPP to push this initiative. Now, I know one of them, their, their party isn't in power, but I still think we need to push it. If they want to get this done, then the monies have got to be loosened up um, and, and it's got to happen. So that's my two cents worth. I'll get off the bandwagon on that. Next slide, please. Um, the next thing is we've talked about this before, but this is the infrastructure uh, mapping and gap analysis project, which is well underway. And that's in conjunction with our consultant, Amadeo Bernardi. Uh, and phase one, which is, is been going on, is a comprehensive asset inventory and gap analysis, in, including uh, what's called ground truthing, which is uh, surveying in the field, looking into the market and so, so on, collecting data, um, meeting with uh, various uh, organizations such as Bell, um, SMT and others and YorkNet to get all the stuff together. So to get the mapping further in progress and, and uh, steps are going in the right direction with all that sort of thing happening. And plus uh, the consultant has had various meetings with other organizations as well along the way. Phase two is very interesting. It's the strategic development to address identified service gaps. We are putting together a collaborative strategy with Bell to address the remaining 6% of homes that will continue to be under service after the current build is complete. As we have said before, Bell is guaranteed that they can cover 94% uh, of our community, maybe more as we go forward, uh, but there's still gonna be about 6% that needs some help. Um, so we're trying to work to make that happen. And there's also a lot of activity going on exploring options for municipal tower infrastructure to support expanded wireless service. Because in the beginning, it's not going to be all fiber, can't be. It's going to have to be some wireless. So between the two things, it, it, it should happen um, and we can get the whole thing covered. Uh, next slide, please. And um, phase three is the last part of it, and that's a review and alignment of municipal policies, procedures, and programs. Um, the Economic Development uh, Department has convened a, a and initiated a cross-departmental working group to ensure effective communication and collaboration regarding the adoption of smart technology and broadband infrastructure. Well, it was interesting going back a few months, and I'm glad that this has happened, because we are merely working away on the broadband stuff, but we really didn't have a good grasp on what was going on uh, in, in the smart technology uh, areas. So an example of that is the new LED streetlights uh, that are smart ready. And then you can ask questions like, how can this opportunity be leveraged effectively with the broadband and other things that happens, et cetera. Now, the other thing is unfortunately, because of COVID, in response to the constraints of the lockdown, all three of these projects 
phases are, are being undertaken concurrently. So we're chewing gum and running at the same time. Next slide, please. Um, in addition to that, um, the BWG continues to meet virtually uh, and we're closely following uh, other technological developments, such as the stat satellites and Starlinks. A lot of interesting things going, um, uh, interesting things going on in those areas as well. And we'll keep you up to date if anything looks useful for us. Um, we're also doing ongoing participation in our meetings with uh, infrastructure and service providers. We don't want everything to just be. We with Bell, we want everybody else to have opportunities to do stuff and so on. But having said that, um, I'll throw in a plug. I had install, installed the new Bell high-speed fiber last week to our home, and boy, is it fast. It's just absolute gangbusters. Um, unbelievable, and they did a good job. So uh, kudos to Bell, um, and... Uh, they're they're doing what they said uh, they would do, and I'm I'm very happy with that, as I know the rest of the group is, and so on. Okay, that's my little save for tonight, and I'll turn it over to Margot, and she's going to talk about the Bell MOU and servicing the last mile. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Terry. And yeah, we are focusing on the work that we're doing with Bell right now. But that, to to reiterate, as Terry said, we work with all of the internet service providers. Uh, and and part of the mandate, you know, the initial uh, focus is getting 100% coverage and getting access across the community. But then beyond that, we're looking at affordability and and, and um, encouraging competition to make sure that not only our residents have access to um, I know a high level of service, but they also have choice and they have uh, affordability and predictability in that service. But uh, with respect to Bell in particular, um, because of a lot of, and I have to credit the work of my colleagues in, in uh, CIES, uh, because it's through some internal policy improvements that we've been able to um, encourage Bell to do much more. And as you, I'm sure we've all seen, uh, there are a number of fiber installation builds going on throughout the community. And um, we're just working right now to refine a memorandum of understanding that will sort of uh, document and finalize this approach, um, which is sort of streamline the approvals process in, internally and will solidify their commitment to a $17 million investment into infrastructure in our community, um, with uh, which will lead to that 95, 96% coverage um, by end of year 2022. Uh, the way things are progressing, um, it, we um, have every confidence that it will actually come sooner than that. So um, this, I think, is a really exciting model, and I've already been contacted by other municipalities are looking to enter into similar agreements. Uh, I think it shows, um, you know, it's a it's a huge leap forward over where we were even 12 months ago. And uh, as I said, I, we couldn't have done it without the cooperation and the hard work of our of our colleagues in in engineering and the folks that review the municipal consents because uh, that's been critical to being able to advance this process. So I look forward to coming back with a an announcement of uh, of a memorandum of understanding very shortly. Next slide, please. Uh, in, with respect to servicing that last mile, the, so the, the we've identified six pockets of areas that aren't going to be covered by the current builds uh, by either Bell or other service providers, and that represents approximately 300 homes. So we're now working to uh, develop a strategy to be able to um, work with the, those residents, reach out to those residents and engage their interest in being able to work collaboratively uh, to, to explore options to, to fund the difference between what would normally, um, you know, be within the business case of, a, of an internet service provider and being able to um, sort of uh, make that additional investment to be able to bring fiber to some of these more remote neighborhoods. Um, we're it, what amounts to about a $350,000 investment uh, across these six uh, six areas within the municipality. So uh, I think we can, you know, there there are models out there where resident coalitions have been have, uh, have been formed to be able to address this. So um, I will be coming back to council with an update on that. Um, and we're also working on, um, you know, as Terry mentioned, it's not just fiber to the home, although that is, you know, the ideal, most future-proof solution. We're looking at wireless as well. So working 
with a number of providers uh, for, for tower installations, for wireless connectivity, and looking how we can be the most strategic so that we um, we can leverage some of the existing infrastructure working with York Region and for you know um, placement on water towers, for example, and then looking at where we might have an opportunity to leverage existing municipal land or infrastructure um, to be able to get towers up to increase connectivity. Uh, because it's not just internet, there's also cell service that we have to consider as well. So uh, I'd be more than happy to entertain any questions, as I'm sure um, my colleague Terry would as well, if, if members of council have any questions or comments. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Before I um, ask for questions, um, thank you so much for all the work your committee has done. Um, Terry, Russell, um, thank you ever so much for the amount of work that you've done for your community and, and we're very pleased and blessed to have you uh, in an area that you know like the back of your hand and, 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 uh, and we're having full advantage of all of that. So thank you very much. And, and the re rest of the committee, please share their, uh, our, our thanks uh, with them as well for all their work. Um, now, we have questions, I'm sure. I'll start with uh, Councillor Persuccini, then I'll go to Councillor Crone, and I'll keep a list here, and we'll just keep on going. How's that? Go ahead, no, Councillor Persuccini. Just a comment that we have come so far away from when I was at Fairbrain Gate. Look where we are today. So I'm very pleased, very uh, how far we have got since I was living at Fairbrain Gate. Way to go! Good job. Thank you. Um. Councillor Crone, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And I'd just like to add on uh, my uh, appreciation for all the hard work that the committee has done. They're all volunteers and uh, sharing of their own time. And uh, so thank you, uh, Terry Russell, for your uh, for your leadership on this. It's, it's appreciated. Uh, and I'm glad you're at the helm of this. Uh, I think, uh, uh, Madam Mayor, that uh, Margot Bejan may have uh, she, she touched on about how we've improved our processes, but I, I think it's important to, to reiterate just how how uh, impactful that has been uh, by improving our internal processes with Mr. Molinari's team. And, and uh, you know, we, <laughs> Bell regarded us, not just Bell, but others regarded East Quillenberry as sort of like the, the worst place to do business in. And now we've been moved up to the best place to do business. And that, that gets us um, on top of the consideration list when they have new projects to launch. And, and so that's, that has been very, very, very impactful for us. And, and I think if, uh, if there's one good thing that's come out of this pandemic, it is gone a light very brightly on the need for uh, improved internet connectivity, especially in the rural areas, which uh, is, is predominantly in, in, in my ward. Uh, and so I'm very appreciative of all the hard work that's been, been undertaken. And uh, I know we're, uh, when we started this, you know, we didn't know where, you know, where, where to start because there was just so many issues around it. And uh, I wouldn't have guessed three years ago, you know, when we, at this term of council, that internet fiber uh, cable would have been uh, a possibility in the rural roads. And now, and now it is. And so that's, that's an incredible leap in three years time. So I'll, I'll just, I'll throw the question out to, uh, to, to uh, Margot Bejan and even Terry Russell if, if you you take a poke at this uh, with York Net, you know they put in some funding requests that could have a really big impact on what we're doing uh, in in uh, in in East Gwillimbury, certainly in the rural section. Do you have any sense of of the timelines of when we might hear back? I know you know government's not always the quickest to get back, but I would really love some sense of when we might be able to hear whether we're successful or not. Through you, Madam Mayor, um, I, our consultant um, Amadeo Bernardi has been trying to keep tabs because he's a little, he's sort of closely linked to this process, and uh, his latest projection was August. So, but I mean that it's, uh, the the needle has kept moving, so we have you know it keeps getting pushed back. Uh, but certainly that is a you know that being able to have uh, fiber run along all regional roads, even those six pockets that we talked about that. Um, that drastically reduces the cost of pulling fiber to those communities. Uh, so, uh, you know, that would have a huge impact and make it more affordable for, for them. And also, um, it would it would expand fiber to the home in areas where they're now currently only served by wireless. So it's it's a it's a huge opportunity. Um, 
uh, so yeah, but I mean, fingers crossed. That's why I'm like, you know, in this, on the slide, uh, we're hoping August we get some word or sooner would be nice. <laughs> Uh, very well, thank you, Madam Mayor. I will wait uh, patiently until August. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Councillor Roy Di Clemente. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I want to say that um, that that broadband and, and high-speed internet has been one of those, oh, it's really hard items on our agenda. And we'd always felt, at least from my perspective, that it was complex and really hard to address. And I think today um, that problem has been really scoped down for us and it doesn't seem so quite so insurmountable. And I want to commend everyone who's done um, what I consider to be a Herculean task uh, to, to bring it to this point here. Uh, and so I, I feel a tremendous amount of hope and I'm, I'm sitting here going, OK, so if it's three hundred and fifty thousand dollars for three hundred homes, how much is that per house? And is that and that's not an insurmountable amount of money, given some of the price points that people have been quoting us as their monthly data bills. So uh, maybe and this is just I'm throwing it out there as a brainstorming item. Maybe this is something that becomes a local improvement charge, uh, like if we were to be uh, improving uh, um, uh, stormwater management or th things like that for those residents. So, so that might be an option for us. But to think that it's now the problem is essentially scoped to 300 homes in six pockets um, is, un is quite frankly uh, unbelievable to me that we've got gone so far so fast. Um, what I did want to ask was, um, with respect to the MOU, um, I understand that that memorandum would um, streamline the approvals for Bell to continue the work that they've already started and have, and have significantly advanced. Is there any other obligation on the part of the municipality uh, to Bell? Because it seems to me that if it if it's just a question of making it faster to get approvals for them to spend $17 million locally, I'm all in. But I, I want to make sure because it feels too good to be true. Well, I, through you, Madam Mayor, I, and certainly um, uh, either uh, our solicitor or Mr. Molinari may may um, choose to add some commentary because they've been involved in the in finalizing um, the wording. But it also deals with restoration processes. So in terms of how the sidewalks are restored, um, and just and just documents those processes. There, nothing um, you know is is. Uh, new or I you know I don't think they you know in any way puts us at a disadvantage it, these are processes that are being used successfully in other municipalities but um, they were a new I guess for East Willenbury so our engineering folks have had an opportunity to to look at those so it 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 really just um, sort of documents our working relationship and and what is expected um, there are certainly um, uh, channels for recourse if there are any questions or there are details around response times if uh, residents have have concerns or complaints so um it sort of reflects the what has evolved in in recent months but um, um allows bell to have um some confidence in their planning process which we know um confidence and surety is is important in any kind of investment and it allows us to have a um you know the same kind of uh confidence in knowing that um the work will go forward and what's expected of us Thank you. That's helpful. I think it would also uh, having that in place also helps address the, that question of, OK, so Bell tore up my front lawn and, and, and they put C down instead of sod and there's gravel and what's happening. And so I think that's helpful from that perspective. Uh, another question, if I may, Madam Mayor, um, through you to, uh, to to Ms. Beijing or, or Mr. Russell, uh, the ICON funding, I seem to recall that that was applied for quite some time ago. Um, the request is for us to nudge our MPR or our MPP. I wonder whether a letter or signed by the mayor or a resolution passed by this council would would be helpful or or not. So I'm just I'm throwing that out there as an option to say, listen, you know, this this application was put in and I think it was 2018 if I'm not mistaken maybe even earlier uh, you know it was put in at this time and and we're still waiting um, and and just reminding people that that's step that's outstanding would that be helpful madam mayor I'll defer to uh, to chair Dr. Terry Russell to respond but I believe so yes, <laughs> uh, yes absolutely um, just to back up half a second I attended a seminar webinar 
uh, about a month ago, and there was two case studies in the webinar. One was for the region of Dryden, and the other was uh, for the region of Muskoka and what they're trying to do and so on. And the issue of funding came up, um, and out of it, people talked about don't don't get delusional in terms of the money that the governments have to, uh, to put out. Um, their conclusions were that about one in 10 application could get approved. So you have to compete for the money and you have to compete for it hard. And it's the old story, who's, he who screams loudest, or she, uh, or who pokes the fire the hardest, generally wins. And I think we are going to have to do that to make sure that we get our, our share of, of what we should have. So I, I would strongly recommend it. And as I said, um, I, I think a, a chat with the MP and the MPP, again, can't can't hurt. So that's my two cents for it, as a citizen. Thank you. That's very helpful. You just sometimes you just never know how much you want to go to the well or how large uh, an ask you you want to um, present. Uh, but but in listening to your explanation, absolutely. And we do have good uh, working relationships with with both our federal and provincial people. They are uh, living in our community, not in uh, an adjoining community. And I do believe that they feel they have an obligation to us on a regular basis. So we'll certainly follow through with that and, and see where we can go with it. Other questions, comments? Councillor Crothers, go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, not a question, just a, a great big thank you uh, to both Terry and Margo and everyone else who's been working on this. What a huge difference you've made for our residents. So thank you so very, very much. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, as Councillor Roy Clemente said, that this was complex and it was hard, but it was essential. And uh, so thank you for, for moving the needle on this. Appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I have a motion here, be it resolved that Corporate Services Economic Development Grants presentation dated June 15th, 2021, entitled Broadband Working Group Progress Update be received. And I'm gonna say with thanks, Councillor Roy DiClemente, go ahead, please. Thank you. I was going to request uh, that we add, and I'm happy to make the motion that we add that uh, direction to staff that uh, a resolution be prepared and brought to our next meeting for um, for a nudge. I don't know how I'd want to word it, but I think we just need to we need to get squeaky <laughs> <laughs> with respect to uh, the ICON funding. So uh, just that we direct staff to to bring a resolution for our consideration at a future uh, to a future meeting. Um, with respect to the ICON funding. Thank you. You'll move that. Thank you. And do I have a seconder? Councillor Crone. All in favor? And that's carried. Thank you very much, both of you, for all the, all the hard work that you're doing to make a difference for our community. It's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I'm at item H, Legal and Council Support Services. And... Um, I think Mr. Horner is here. Thank there you, you are. Honor. Hello. Uh, a couple thank you. A couple items on the agenda this evening. The um, the, the first is a uh, is a memo. Just wanted council to know that uh, we've uh, we've we've hired a uh, 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 officer Kyle McGuire as a bylaw enforcement officer from uh, Innisfil. Uh, he's going to be working with us to uh, backfill an officer who's on leave. And so the, the memo is just to let you know that uh, Officer McGuire has been hired and also that we have a, um, a bylaw on at the end of the agenda to um, uh, formally appoint him so that he can lay charges. So happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Is, is he a seasoned bylaw officer? He's young. He's, he, he's, he's young, but he's, but, but he, but he's experienced. So uh, uh, I, I think that the thinking is that, uh, you know, maybe he'll start out with uh, some of the parking offenses. That's, that seems to be uh, where the bylaw officers kind of cut their teeth. And, uh, but uh, he'll, he'll be able to uh, lay a charge under any bylaw as required. Very welcome news. 
Uh, any questions, comments? Uh, Councillor Foster, would you move this, please? Thank you. And uh, Councillor Morton? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you very much. Do you have anything else? Mr. Horner, you have uh, you have a second one. Yes, please go ahead. A verbal mm -hmm. update. That's right. At the uh, at the last uh, council meeting, uh, we, we presented options for the uh, 2022 election for council's consideration. And uh, um, council liked the idea of um, uh, staff going out to do some public outreach to, to sort of see uh, uh, how the public would like to see the uh, 2022 municipal election unfold. So uh, the uh, clerk and deputy have done a fine job in terms of um, proposing some outreach options and uh, I'll just turn it over to uh, to the clerk now and uh, he'll let you know what's being proposed. Thank you. Thank you through you, Madam Mayor, members of council. <clears throat> so we just uh, wanted to touch base again because we talked about this last week and uh, we have some pretty aggressive timelines in terms of uh, reaching out to the public and just wanted to share with uh, with you here at this council meeting before we um, launch uh, our perspective date is July 1st for the entire month of July. But if we can go to the next slide, please. Can we go to the next slide, Tara, please? Having some technical difficulties. So if we can follow along on the on your own agenda. So what we uh, took out uh, uh, from last week's workshop, which I, I thank all members of council, was very uh, a healthy discussion. And we took away some, um, some key points that uh, we've taken into consideration. One was that, uh, you know, there was an appetite to include uh, some form of non-traditional voting method and, uh, and provide something on election day that was still in person and familiar to uh, EG residents. And then to go out to the public and conduct a, uh, a public outreach um, and, and come back in September with a final recommendation. So <clears throat> our public outreach plan includes um, the, and this is in collaboration with our, uh, our fine communication staff. We're gonna develop a uh, survey uh, with uh, specific questions on, uh, you know, the different methods of voting and how re residents may want to uh, choose to vote in 2022. Uh, develop a pre-recorded uh, educational vid video on the different methods of voting and uh, and ask for a call to action. And, and everything kind of leads to a um, specific election uh, URL webpage that will have, you know, the educational video, the survey, um, maybe some other additional information, some dates, etc. Uh, we're going to um, uh, leverage uh, the the water bills, the July water bills. We were this close to making the uh, the tax bills, the final tax bills, but uh, uh, the crunch time was way too fast. So <clears throat> we're still, excuse me, <clears throat> pardon me. We're still uh, at a crunch time in terms of making those water bills, uh, but we're going to put sort of a um, bookmark kind of insert in the water bills, which will hit 9,000 residents that are on water and serve, uh, water and sewer. And those will include actually tenants, which is a good thing because tenants often get missed in elections uh, as uh, you, you council members and candidates, prior candidates would know. Um, we're going to conduct a virtual uh, information session with our uh, with your council appointed uh, committees and uh, groups. And again, the intent is show them the video, uh, sh uh, show do a brief presentation uh, similar to what we presented to you, and then have like an open dialogue with uh, with those residents. And uh, we're going to put out some cur uh, curb signs at each ward. Uh, we're going to have like QR codes uh, that lead to the website, uh, conduct social media uh, campaigning. We're going to advertise in the um, bulletin, which I believe is a July-August circulation, and it hits every um, 
uh, municipal address in EG, which is is a great thing, and it gets uh, quite a bit of traction uh, according to communications. We're going to obviously advertise on our, our town page, and uh, we're going to be attending the farmers market in July, uh, probably sort of mid to end July for three consecutive weeks, and uh, try to promote um, uh, you know folks for taking that survey. We're looking at um, enticing people to take the survey by including uh, uh, some prizes uh, that uh, our economic development folks are, are going to help us uh, uh, collect from local businesses and uh, we're, we're going to pay for those. We're not soliciting uh, those from uh, businesses. We're going to pay for them and offer them as prizes uh, for uh, residents that participate in the survey. So that's the extent of, in terms of next steps. Um, as I indicated, we're going to do this for the month of July and then come back um, early September. September 8th is, is your first council meeting after the summer break. Um, want to emphasize the importance of uh, council's decision and, and, and making a decision relatively um, as soon as possible. Um, we're going to be uh, conducting that report with some recommendations on on recommendations that uh, you may have already seen or perhaps there's a a different flavor from the public outreach and we'll include that in, uh, detail in in the report uh, but we're really looking for a council decision on september 8th so that we can go out to market and get uh, a qualified uh, good reputable vendor uh, for whatever method that uh, council chooses. So if there's any questions on the public outreach, I'd be more than happy to respond. Thank you very much. Questions? Councillor Roy DiClemente, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Through you to Mr. Lomana, uh, what's your budget for this? Has this been accounted for in the, the 2021 operating budget? Through you, Madam Mayor, and Councillor <coughs> Rodi Clemente is not uh, is not a part of our operating budget per se, but uh, we're anticipating approximately about twenty five hundred dollars, um, you know, with the survey, with the with the video. Um, but I mean, it's it's a minimal uh, expense to to outreach, but uh, I, I'm sure we'll find be able to find that in our existing operating budget. Thank you. I, I thought it might be a much higher budget given that it's so fulsome. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Crone, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor, through you to the clerk. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, uh, you know, uh, adapting and, and responding to uh, what Council uh, had uh, discussed last time. I appreciate, uh, you know, you want to move faster on this and, uh, and uh, we all want to move quickly, but I thought the uh, public uh, engagement was important so i really i'm really happy with what you've put together and uh it's uh i, I think it'll do a nice job of uh, letting people know what we're thinking and then and, and hopefully we'll get some engagement and people will get excited about this and uh, i'm happy to offer up uh, councillor roy de clemente's uh, municipal budget uh, if you're having trouble paying for uh, all your ear <laughs> your outreach thank you madam mayor no further questions thank you Councillor Crothers, we'll divide go ahead, it seven ways. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Crothers, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation and uh, the thoroughness of, of the consultation um, that that you scoped out here. Um, under the what we've heard, the one piece that jumped out at me that um, didn't sound like it was heard was about the pilot. That uh, I know there's a lot of uh, comments. Um, from a couple of councillors about uh, wanting to see a, a uh, option of having these new um, methods in a pilot, either at the advanced pools or in uh, you know certain parts of different wards. We need to see what goes wrong. Uh, I would hate to have, uh, even if we have great um, you know public outreach and people want to uh, be you know voting online or whatever, I still want to see it piloted because I think there's a potential for something to go wrong. And if it's a small pilot, we can correct, uh, we can, can course correct as necessary. Um, so just ask that that get uh, highlighted on, on what we've heard. Um, I can speak louder if you didn't hear. 
just just easy. No. Um, no, you're fine. <laughs> um, for the uh, consultation, it's always uh, we always get blowback when we consult during the summer. Uh, but then, you know, September's not good because kids are getting back to school and, you know, we there, I know there's pushback whenever uh, we consult during the summer. So I'm just wondering if it's possible even to do a bit of a social media teaser campaign starting ASAP saying that we're looking at changing the voting methods and be aware of this. And that way we can at least say we started mid-June. Um, so just, it doesn't have to be fully thought out, but just uh, let people know this is coming. Um, and then uh, I think we've given people that larger window. Um, the, the last question I have is about the Curbex uh, signs. That's fantastic. It reaches people who are on social media, but I'm not really sure how, maybe you can explain to me how the QR code works on a Curbex sign, which is mainly for drive-by traffic. I'm feeling like you need to be uh, up close to grab the QR code. Uh, maybe I'm missing something. Through you, through you Madam Mayor. Um... I too asked the same question, Councillor Crothers, because of my age and not understanding what what the QR codes and how they work. But uh, according to my deputy clerk, who's uh, very uh, familiar with QR codes, they they do work on on those signs. Even if you're driving by, there's a signal or or something that the 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 smartphones pick up. Um, and they often do it in 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 urban centers as well. So that's that's how they work on the Q the the uh, Curbex sign. So I don't know the technology behind it. I'm my apologies, but it will also the the Curbex signs will also have uh, the website address um, for those that don't have the ability to you know take a picture or technically challenge such as myself. Okay, um, I, I would like to know more about that because uh, I don't think it's about being technically challenged. I understand how QR codes work. Um, but what I'm concerned about is that it's the Curbex signs are, are um, designed for drivers. And now we're asking them to interact with their smartphone while they're driving. And uh, that that just to me is, is problematic. Um, QR codes on on posters, that sort of thing, that that sounds good. But if the Curbex signs are designed for drivers and we're asking drivers to interact with the signs, um, that sends a, a dangerous message and, and uh, so I'm happy to have a conversation with somebody um, but it's not not a lack of understanding about QR codes work it's understanding how they work and uh, concern about uh, the message we're sending to drivers to interact with our signs. No your point okay. is well taken thank you Councillor Crothers and we'll we'll definitely take that into consideration so. And if you could follow up with me if, if there's uh, some new technology I haven't uh, heard of thank you. Other questions, comments? Councillor Foster, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Lamont, I'm just thinking about the um, the timeline and, and uh, the fact that we want to get this, uh, this done as soon as we can. Um, do you have a bit of a buffer zone built in there if, per se, uh, the public comes back strongly against something that we're we're thinking on trying uh, I'm, I'm just wondering how fast um you know if there's a, if there's a buffer zone in there that we have to make some changes through you madam mayor to uh councillor foster no it's a it's a good point and uh i mean i guess the ultimate buffer zone is uh eg reverts back to the traditional method which we've always done and you don't have to consider alternative voting methods this is uh um, in terms of, um, in, uh, as well, additionally, in response to Councillor Crothers and timing and getting the message out, that was my intent with respect to talking to you again today, as well as last week. We're on a public agenda. Uh, we're live streamed. So the, the ideas of the different voting methods are already out there. Uh, communications can can certainly help with uh, you know councils thinking about different methods keep your eye open for uh, survey to follow um, but uh, yeah ultimately it, it the methods have been presented to council um, there's not going to be a different method that pops out from the public um, uh, input it's just you know really what the uh, the appetite of your residents uh, for those who respond uh, are considering uh, on 
wanting to vote in 2022 for your municipal elections, um, you know, the the options are still traditional tabulators, vote by mail or internet or a combination thereof. So um, those will still be present on this September 8th report and ultimately be council's decision to choose from. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Morton and then Councillor Roy De Clemente. Uh, not at this time, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Roy De Clemente. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Just, um, I guess from my perspective, I think we need to be cautious. I, I, I'm happy to uh, undertake all of this this public outreach, but I think we need to be cautious about what we're expecting as far as results are concerned. We have a we have a significant challenge in getting people to actually vote. Uh, I think it's uh, it's it's asking a lot to to have people respond to a survey about how they would like to vote, and ultimately the decision rests with us. And uh, I do want to hear uh, what what our engaged citizens and those who who are who care about the matter uh, share with us. Um, but I suspect that that our that the response will be somewhat muted, and we should be prepared for that. And that's just you know just a comment I wanted to share with you. Thanks. Thank you. I'm seeing a few people nodding with that as well. Yes. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions or comments. Uh, with that, could I have uh, Councillor Roy De Clemente, would you move this? And Councillor Foster, would you second that? Thank you. All those in favor? And that's carried. Are there any other items on legal and council support services at this time? Nothing else on the agenda, Madam Mayor, but uh, very happy to take questions. Any questions of Mr. Horner? Seeing none, we will move along to item I and that's community parks, recreation and culture. Mr. Carmen Zanon, I believe you're here with us. There you are. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, through you, uh, staff are pleased to provide an, an exciting uh, update today and a presentation on the Health and Active Living Plaza project. I would ask that the clerks uh, Please uh, display the um, the presentation. Thank you. Uh, three, Madam Mayor, uh, the Health and Active Living Plaza project is uh, is progressing very well. Uh, I'd ask the clerks to go to the next slide, please. So our site plan uh, and facility design is now just past the 50% mark as far as the, the, the total design for the site plan and facility. Uh, the design at the council approved thinking green uh, development standard or design standards is on track to be complete by next year in quarter two of uh, 2022. Uh, at the request of the Environmental Advisory Committee, uh, REI Committee, and with council direction, staff are pre preparing a report back uh, to council on some sustainability options, including uh, some net zero concepts for council consideration. Uh, staff's planning that report back for next July, uh, the next July council meeting. Uh, staff will be requesting that it uh, be a report back through a council meeting, not necessarily a workshop as indicated on this slide, as uh, uh, council direction will be required uh, in order to proceed further with uh, to complete the design. Next slide, please. So the components or the facility fit uh, are, are uh, consistent uh, with uh, what our residents have requested, uh, EG's first aquatic center, a library, gymnasium with a track and potential fitness area, a children's play and activity area, as well as uh, programming space. The site also includes an abundance of outdoor, uh, passive and active recreational spaces. Next slide, please. So the exterior elevations uh, have been re refined to represent more of a progressive uh, clean line and more modest built form uh, and the built form uh, has also been integrated with many of the natural elements that um, are more indicative of, of some of the architecture uh, in East Willenbury, uh, incorporating natural elements such as steel, masonry, uh, sustainable wood accents, 
and large scale glazing to invite residents in and then also give residents uh, a view into the natural spaces and parkland surrounding uh, the facility. Next slide, please. This is a, a landscape uh, perspective from the mixed use development, again showing the library and aquatic centre and as well with some of the uh, steel and wood accents as well as the uh, rich masonry that have been introduced uh, into the built form. Next slide please. This is a view of the front porch and uh, specifically the library as you can see uh, use of uh, large-scale glazing again uh, giving windows into the facility inviting people in. Next slide please. As well the uh, aquatic center uh, with the uh, sustainable wood awning uh, that we're proposing and again the uh, large-scale glazing and uh, masonry features. Next slide please. A view of the uh, front porch and this is from the extended boardwalk uh, that will uh, traverse the uh, entire frontage of the facility and uh, this space will also be programmed uh, for placemaking and gathering. Next slide please. Again, uh, large scale glazing and views into the aquatic center and library, uh, you know, welcoming people into the facility. Next slide, please. Uh, we are proposing a sustainable uh, green uh, 50 year sustainable wood awning and a Koya uh, as a naturally sourced uh, material and a green building material. That's that has a guaranteed life of 50 years uh, with, with no fading or deterioration. Next slide, please. Within the facility, uh, we're, we're uh, proposing large scale viewing gallery uh, with uh, on deck viewing and uh, for our residents to, to view, uh, for example, when children are having swim lessons or leisure swim, those, those types of opportunities. Next slide, please. The aquatic center consists of a lap pool, which would be for lane swim, uh, fitness and, and potential competition, uh, leisure pool and learning tank in a hydrotherapy pool for instruction. Uh, all three tanks would be uh, fully accessible with ramps uh, in and out of each pool from the deck. Next slide, please. Uh, another example of the large scale glazing at the north of the facility uh, with adjacent parkland with views into the facility and then views out to the to the parkland as well. Next slide, please. A uh, view from the north of the facility on the right, you can see the gym and fitness space and on the left, you can see views into the aquatic center. This would be from the active uh, area of the park uh, to the north of the facility. Next slide, please. Uh, at the back of the facility is the back porch and this uh, view shows uh, generous views into the interior boardwalk space and as well as the gymnasium space and activity space uh, for children. Next slide please. Uh, just another example of the view into the gymnasium space. Uh, uh, the elevated area will be a, a running track and uh, we're hoping that, uh, that that running track will provide some nice views into the, the Queensville Valley lands uh, to the east. Next slide, please. Another example of uh, some, uh, you know, the back entranceway and the activity space uh, in children's activity space. Next slide, please. Uh, the exterior space uh, uh, at the south will feature a large courtyard space and parkland, including playgrounds, community gardens, outdoor kitchen area, and, uh, and reading gardens. Uh, this shows uh, a view at, at dusk uh, where the facility will have uh, accent lighting as well. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows again the courtyard space uh, with a potential green roof uh, canopy that's visible from the courtyard space uh, that we could use as an educational and, and interpretive display as well. Next slide, please. 
And uh, in closing, uh, this shows again the courtyard space uh, with a community garden, outdoor kitchen and gathering space uh, with the green roof canopy uh, located to the left of the, uh, of the screen. Um, that concludes our presentation for today. I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that Council may have uh, related to the refinements to the design, the progress on the project, and as well as the upcoming Council uh, Sustainability uh, Report and uh, presentation uh, for July. Thank you very much, Mr. Carmison. Questions? I'm not seeing any uh, at this time. Could you tell me uh, at what, where we are as far as, um, I know you've mentioned several items that we we need to continue to uh, work on before we before we go to tender. At what point would would we be going out to tender? Through you, Madam Mayor, uh, at the current design, and, and we are tracking to be in a position to tender by Q2 2022. Uh, that's when we will have tender ready drawings. Uh, we will be presenting some net zero uh, options or some net zero concept options. With those options, uh, because they, they are uh, over and above the thinking green development standards, they would require additional design time and that may affect the schedule and we will we will report those out in advance to council at the time of the um of the the council report in july uh, so if we stay the course at the thinking green development standards uh, we would be in a position to tender the project in q2 of, of 22 uh, 2022 thank you uh councillor persicini go ahead please if nobody has any questions, I'll move this. I think we have some questions, but I'll hold that thought and I'll get back to you. Uh, Councillor Crothers and then Councillor Roy DiClemente. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this presentation. It looks fantastic. Looks like there's a little no mo may going on uh, in the courtyard like that. Um, at, I think it's important that, that uh, we take the time to make sure that we're doing this right. Uh, this building is going to be with us for a long time and uh, if there ends up being a slight delay so that we can make it future ready um, i think our residents will appreciate that and certainly uh, future generations will appreciate uh, the time and the effort that we're taking to ensure that it's uh, uh, at, at the minimum net zero ready uh, so that it, it is ready for the future so thank you very much for uh, taking the time to do that thank you councillor roy de clemente Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, unfortunately, I think I have a different perspective on that. And um, for me, I'm actually very concerned that the architects have put the pen down. And uh, I know that in uh, Q1, that our direction to staff was to uh, to listen to the the Environment Advisory Committee to hire the uh, the uh, the additional expertise. Uh, and and see what the consultant came up with. Our direction was for for a report and a report back to us. And so uh, I was hoping that this was the report from the consultant, so that we weren't going to lose time. At this point, looking at the council calendar, we will lose six weeks of time uh, on this project. And quite frankly, from my perspective, this is something that we've been working on uh, as long before I was on council, but certainly since I've been on council. And uh, I feel like we're starting to run out of uh, run out of some room on the runway and uh, losing six weeks uh, at this point in the project when we have high priced consultants, uh, excellent staff who are, have the expertise on on hand as well as their as well as the engineering firms uh, that can do this for us. Uh, I don't want to wait six weeks. And uh, if there if there's a report ready and there's uh, options to be presented to us, I want to hear them and give direction to staff so that we don't lose six weeks of of uh, of planning time. Those six weeks could be used to in uh, in Q1 uh, to award a tender and uh, and get shovels in the ground uh, in 2022. If we wait too long. We won't be able to, we'll, we'll miss that construction season and our community needs this facility now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there's no reason why when reports are ready that we can't call a meeting. Uh, we do that uh, uh, all the time. As a matter of fact, for, for items that uh, 
are of importance that uh, we need to get council together. So, um, Mr. Karmazin, you're hearing some comments, and I'm sure that uh, there'll be some discussion regarding um, that as well. Are there any other comments or questions? Councillor Crone, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you too, uh, Mr. Karmazin. Uh, regardless of when we start, when when uh, how long do you think it'll take uh, from first gravel in the ground to first uh, you know dip in the pool? Uh, how long do you think it'll take for us to to realize mm -hmm. this project? Uh, not that I'm anxious or anything. <laughs> for you, Madam Mayor, uh, a, a construction of this size and scope would uh, typically take eighteen to twenty four months. Okay. Yeah. So it's yeah. It's not. We're not like we're not building a uh, a garden shed. This is a a monumental task, and uh, um, I can appreciate it. It'll take time. That, actually, I'm, that's better than I thought it would be. So uh, I appreciate your answer. Thank you, Madam Randall, for the question. For those of us that have been uh, wanting uh, and um, requesting. Um, the needs of our community it it's it's never quick enough uh we've been uh, i i've been on council 21 years i heard it back then we made a decision probably at at 12 or 14 years that i was here and uh and so for for me uh, i i'm probably uh impatient uh, I'd like to see it move along as quickly as we can. Uh, I know it's a massive project and I know there are a lot of details that are yet to be determined. Um, but I know that Mr. Karmazin is is uh, gathering information today and will gather information in the coming weeks uh, from all of us and from his experts that are working with him on this to to uh, to come back with a report on on where we're going to be. Uh, at a different time. Councillor Persicini, I think you had your hand up. Yes, go ahead, please. Yes, Madam Mayor, the question I have to to uh, Manager Commerson is uh, regarding the cost of lumber. If we keep waiting, uh, things are goes, it's going skyrocket. Uh, what happens, uh, you know, do we have a commitment of a lot of, like you said, we have, we, you said we are, uh, we are on budget right now, which is great, uh, or oh, under budget, whatever, I forget what you said, uh, but, how does that work? Can you explain to me what this, you know, if we get one prize now, does it change? Uh, how does it go? Uh, th through you, Madam Mayor, uh, we do have, as a part of the project team and the architects, estimators that uh, estimate uh, construction, and, and we do have, we have built in estimates just prior to tender. Um, those estimates would uh, take a look at all the drawings and all the specifications and pro provide an estimate back. Construction prices due to COVID have increased significantly with certain types of materials and building systems. Uh, the hope is we are closely monitoring construction indexing uh, year after year. The hope is that uh, with a return to uh, reopening that some of these, uh, some of the pricing with some of the supplies and materials will will stabilize. Uh, a, a good example is lumber, uh, simply because more people are home and doing more uh, home improvement projects. Uh, so there is a uh, there is a spike with uh, with lumber with a reopening that may stabilize and the hope is that uh, we'll start to see some more stability uh, with with some of the construction pricing. But I will also indicate that once we do uh, award uh, a contract for construction, uh, that is a that is a lump sum price for construction, and that will not deviate based on. Uh, any any types of uh, severe market fluctuations? Well, I'm just with uh, Councilor Roy de Clement. I would like to have it sooner than later, and also the mayor. Uh, so I hope that uh, we make the right decision soon and we don't procrastinate and get this thing on our go. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Councilor Crothers, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Knowing how high uh, lumber prices are right now and that they're expected to come down uh, within the next two years, when we're putting something as large as this out to tender, 
do we look at, uh, you know, if we build now, there's a 30% increase in cost, we build a year from now, we're going to save all these millions of dollars. Does, does that factor into when when we put something out to cost? Because as you said, uh, the price is locked in once, once the tenders come back. I, I, I would not want to be tendering on something right now, knowing what uh, the prices are like. Hmm. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, as indicated, we do estimate just prior to time of tender uh, to in, in ensure that we are in keeping with the budget that uh, that uh, council had approved. Uh, sorry, sorry. My um, question was: Do we time our putting something out to tender when we have something uh, as large as this uh, with a lot of lumber involved? Um, knowing that lumber prices are so high, do we, we take that into consideration with the timing of a tender? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, the, the process that we've typically employed is, is prior to tender, we estimate. And if that's in keeping with, uh, with uh, the council approved budget, uh, we would typically proceed to tender if we if we uh, were alerted that uh, we there could be a potential that we could go significantly over budget or we were, would require an adjustment in budget then staff would uh, uh, bring that back and inform council uh, because at that point uh, the budget could be put at at a risk right good okay thank you Thank you. I'm not seeing other questions or comments at this time. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Persicini, no. Councillor uh, Roddy Clemente, you have a hand up for a question, not a not a moving. Go ahead. Well, it has to do, do with the, it has to do with the motion and what we're going to move. So at this point, we're we're moving a receipt. Uh, Mr. Carmazan has advised that he would like uh, direction. So I, I, I don't think that a workshop is the appropriate place for this. I think it needs to be a council meeting. Uh, my concern had been that our next council meeting is not until July 27th, which adds a six week window. So I don't know if we're interested or if there's any appetite uh, to bring uh, to bring it to a, another meeting of council. It, it would have to, I think at this point, be a special meeting of council, uh, but I'd like to leave that door open. Uh, and, and hear from my colleagues. But otherwise, I, th I think we should still be making a motion that we direct staff to bring a report uh, to a council meeting for direction on the sustainability options. Uh, and whether that's a report to a, a council meeting in July or a council meeting on July 27th, I think that I'd like to hear from my, from my, uh, from my colleagues. Thank you. Comments? I would hope if uh, if Mr. Carmison had uh, the information available prior to uh, the end of July that council could call a special council meeting uh, and deal with it at that point. This uh, I, I would say that this is one of the most important decisions that we've made uh, on council for a very long time. Facilities always are, but this one being much larger that uh, I would I would hope that um, we would be able to call a meeting uh, prior to the 22nd of July should all the paperwork uh, be available and ready. That, that would be my thought. I'm OK with that. Any other comments? I'm seeing not I'm seeing nods and yes. OK. Uh, so um, what we have is uh, be it resolved that community parks, recreation uh, and culture facilities branch memorandum dated June 15th, 2021 entitled operations. Sorry, uh, be it resolved that community parks, recreation, and culture presentation dated June 15th, 2021 entitled health and active living plaza update be received and counselor uh, Roy Clemente is is indicating that uh, council directs staff to bring back a report on sustainability options at a future council meeting. So I'm seeing nods. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and I have a mover and a seconder. Are there any questions on the motion? All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you very much. 
we are at item two, and that's Community Parks, Recreation, Culture, Memo, Operations Center, Project Completion. Or, or from one extreme to the other. Uh, thank you. Through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, we're pleased to report uh, that our Operations Center project is now complete. Uh, the project's been delivered under the council approved budget and uh, within the schedule uh, due to COVID, within the revised schedule due to COVID, I should say. Uh, I'd like to extend a special thank you to Chris Canyon, our manager, municipal facilities, uh, for managing this, uh, this large scale project successfully. Uh, occupancy of the facility is expected next week uh, with a phased move in uh, starting in June uh, with COVID health and safety measures, of course. And information about the facility and the support for critical frontline services is included with the memo. And there are attachments with the memo, which include uh, some pictures of the completed project and information highlighting all of the efficiency and environmental features that have been built into the design and the facility. An in-person opening event, unfortunately, at this time uh, can't occur. Uh, but we are planning an event for the fall where we'll have tours and activities uh, for, for our residents uh, and, and to view the facility and the site firsthand. Uh, we have prepared a virtual tour today um, that's been prepared for our, our residents with the assistance uh, from Director of Communications, Laura Hanna, and uh, media release is also uh, being prepared uh, for, um, for an announcement to the media. Uh, I would ask that clerks uh, kindly play the uh, the virtual tour of the facility for mayor, council, and the public. The town of East Gwilinberry's new operations center. This 58,000 square foot facility on a 20 acre site will be the new home to parks, facilities, roads, water, and wastewater staff, and support East Gwilinberry's emergency services as the new home of the town's emergency operations center. Let's take a look inside. We are starting at the main entry of the facility. Residents will be able to visit the facility for various inquiries and to pick up green bins and blue bins. The entire facility is Wi-Fi enabled and there are open and collaborative areas to consult with town staff. Next up is our meeting rooms. This is one of two boardrooms. This room will primarily be used for meetings for up to 12 people, but will also serve as a breakout room whenever the town's emergency operations center is activated. The EOC room is the central facility in which the Emergency Operations Control Group directs, communicates, and supports emergency operations. When not in use, this room is suitable for large meetings, training, and development. Down the hall is the North Field Operator Entrance and Corridor. This field operator entrance connects the employee parking to the lunchroom, washrooms, and staff support areas. The lunchroom is a generous space It, it's not moving through. I think we're going to start again. And there must be a little glitch here. We want to we want to see it all. Welcome to the town of East Gwilinberry's new operations center. This 58,000 square foot facility on a 20 acre site will be the new home to parks, facilities, roads, water, and wastewater staff, and support East Gwilinberry's emergency services as the new home of the town's emergency operations center. Let's take a look inside. We are starting at the main entry of the facility. Residents will be able to visit the facility for various inquiries and to pick up green bins and blue bins. The entire facility is Wi-Fi enabled and there are open and collaborative areas to consult with town staff. Next up is our meeting rooms. This is one of two boardrooms. This room will primarily be used for meetings for up to 12 people, but will also serve as a breakout room whenever the town's emergency operations center is activated. The EOC room is the central facility in which the emergency operations control group directs, communicates, and supports emergency operations. When not in use, this room is suitable for large meetings, training, and development. Down the hall is the North Field Operator Entrance and Corridor. This field operator entrance connects the employee parking to the lunchroom, washrooms, and staff support areas. The lunchroom is a generous space for staff to take breaks. This space will have the ability to hold up to 120 people and can also be used for training. Outdoor space for staff is also located off the lunchroom. 
Carrying on past the lunchroom, we will see space for offices and staging. This area supports the various team's administration functions. The generous staging areas allow a collaborative approach for each of the teams to receive daily work assignments, meet to resolve issues, and complete tasks outside in the field. From the field operator entrances and staff support areas, a corridor connects the administration area to the service bays. Along this corridor, we have a dedicated fitness and wellness room for staff programming and change rooms. They are also connected to the washrooms, showers, mudroom, and a laundry room for work attire and equipment. Once we leave the change room corridor, we enter the service bays. There are five generous drive-through service bays where town vehicles will be cleaned, maintained, and secured. Each of the bays have organized storage space for tools, equipment, and samples. Proper maintenance will enhance the life cycle of each asset. The outside of the operations center has many exciting features as well. This secured area will allow field staff to enter the facility through a sliding gate at the south service entrance. In this area is the town's salt dome which stores salt for winter maintenance, additional storage for seasonal equipment, and the town's first ever greenhouse and tree farm where our in-house horticulturalist will grow flowers and trees required around town. There is also a fueling area and available fleet parking. The facility incorporates systems conserving energy and fostering environmental leadership. Some of these thinking green initiatives include electric vehicle charging, removing phosphorus from stormwater, and harvesting rainwater through front of house infiltration galleries. For more information about the many efficiencies, environmental features and benefits built into the operations center, visit www.eastquillenbury.ca. Thank you for visiting the town's new operations center. Wonderful, it's amazing. I, I can't wait until we all can get in there and have a really good look at it. I'm sure we'll find some time when, when um, COVID will allow us to, to get in and also to the public. I think it's, it's a public funded building and it's going to be important that our public um, are able to tour and, and enjoy the facility and understand the, the, um, the reason why we really needed to to make an investment in an operations center. Um, it's wonderful. So, um, questions of Mr. Carmison. Councillor Crone, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just let me uh, be the first to congratulate uh, Mr. Carmison on uh, coming in uh, under budget on this uh, 465,000 under budget is, you know, you're, you're going to ruin the stereotype of governments uh, running over budget. Um, so uh, well done on that. Uh, but you've, you've now established the benchmark for coming under uh, budget. So you'll have to, you know, percentage wise do the same on the help. Uh, just letting you know what you'll be judged on. Um, can, can you, can you share, just really curious how, how did you manage, especially in the time of, of, of this pandemic, that you were able to, to come under budget? This is a this really is a great news story, and, and uh, I'm really proud to, that, that the team could do this. Uh, thank you, Councillor Crone, and, and thanks for the question. Uh, our team prides ourselves on uh, on uh, strict monitoring and control of uh, of the budget. Uh, quality of work and time on, a, on every project and uh, some of the things we do is is we work with our contractors to determine creative solutions uh, when a change is presented um, and uh, determining with the architectural team and the design team uh, what some creative solutions are um, that do not cost uh, uh, us uh, over and above our base contract so that's one thing that we do um, we, we look at every change with rigor and, and we determine if there's alternate approaches and, uh, and other ways to solve, uh, solve problems. So that's one thing, you know, our team does uh, quite well and uh, that's a testament to the work uh, Chris has done in monitoring 
uh, both the budget, the quality of work, and and the uh, and uh, and the schedule. Well, uh, Madam Mayor, through you again to Mr. Karmas and the, uh, well done. It's uh, certainly, uh, I think this was approved on the previous uh, term of council, if I recall. Um, you know, certainly there's a lot of, I'm sure you've got a lot of uh, best practices and, and learnings out of this uh, to carry forward on your next project. Certainly as we discuss the help, I, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't approach the, the 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 subject lightly because it is it will will be the 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 biggest project we undertake as a council in in our history, and so um, I, I'm glad that you've you've had this as your test run to uh, to learn, uh, and uh, hopefully we can we can uh, approach our next next major project with uh, with that kind of expertise. So uh, uh, anyway, well done, and uh, thank you to you and your team. No further questions, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Webster, you have comments? Can you unmute? You're muted. While we're uh, working with um, Mr. Webster, are there other questions or comments? Yes, Councillor Foster, go may. ahead, and then Councillor um, Morton, go ahead, Councillor Foster. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Mr. Carmers, and I I may have asked this before. <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, in the uh, uh, agenda package, you show a picture of the wash uh, service bay, and I was kind of surprised that. Uh, we hadn't talked at any time with this for an automatic uh, truck wash. Is is that something that is of great expense? And, and I guess, are we wired and plumbed for it if we decide to go that route in the future? I know that um, friends of mine have one in the trucking business and say it's absolutely invaluable as far as uh, preventive maintenance and that kind of stuff go. Uh, I, I I, it seems to me that I may have mentioned this to you before, but I just can't remember. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, uh, it was considered at, at one point early in the project. Uh, we did have uh, um, we did have consultation with the architect. Uh, the architect uh, actually designed and and built the Go uh, Transit station off Bales. And there is a truck wash there, and we did visit it. Uh, or sorry, uh, excuse me, a bus wash. Um, so we did take a look at that uh, option. Uh, they are very expensive, and uh, they are also um, very intensive as far as the maintenance of the different mechanical systems that come into play. Um, you can retrofit a, a you can retrofit a bay to to have that type of equipment. Uh, in consultation with uh, with our, our user departments, uh, it was felt that uh, a, a sort of spray and wash type setup uh, would be more than suffice. Thank you. Councillor Morton. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, through you to Mr. Carmerson. Uh, you mentioned about the um, emergency services operations. Um, what exactly does that entail? Uh, through you, uh, Madam Mayor, it's uh, the appropriate space to set up uh, for all of the um, under the IMS system, the incident management system. Uh, so all of our all of our sections can set up properly, and it also has the um, uh, the, the proper IT functionality of a modern oper uh, operations center. Uh, it also doubles and serves as um, 
it also doubles and serves as a as a very large uh, training space, uh, which uh, uh, end meeting space. Um, so typically, it's best to have dual use of an operations center because hopefully you're not always in a in an emergency and and within your operations center, so you have that that backup use, which is uh, which is training space. Uh, so it's a dual purpose uh, facility portion of the facility. And uh, that was designed closely with former uh, Chief Dawson and Chief McKenzie as well. Uh, so uh, a lot of attention to detail was put into uh, the the um, the design of that uh, operational space. So how is that going to affect um, the operation space that's in our three? Um buildings that we have now and i know for many many years we've been talking about having to set up another uh, fire station um and i mean i know in the last couple of years it's been it's been out there again talking about it so i'm just wondering about expenses as far as uh it concerns with the uh, fire stations that we have now uh, through you madam mayor as far as i know uh th those those spaces will still be used as training spaces within each of the stations, um, and, and then I would refer to to the chief uh, if he would uh, uh, like to elaborate any further on that. Okay, thank you. Chief, go ahead, please. Yes, good evening, and thank you, General uh, Manager Carmazan. Uh, to the councillor's point, the um, the idea is that the primary EOC would transition into the new operations centre at some point in the next couple of months, and we would we would have the uh, the uh, prime which it would what is the primary EOC now at the at station two four in Hall Landing as the backup, but that that state or that that space currently is used more as a training room and a meeting room, so the the, the space won't go to waste. It, every every inch is utilized. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Webster, uh, unless you can put a sign up with a question or uh, your comments, that would be the sign. I'm um, actually good to go now, Madam Mayor. I was- There uh, you are. Had multiple devices going and somehow uh, I silenced this one. So uh, for, uh, first for me in the COVID uh, matter. Um, the question asked to uh, General Manager Karmas and Oh, we just lost you. Lost him again. <laughs> okay. There you are. I muted you. Okay. So I, I, I'm not going to be able to get my praises out for uh, General Manager Carmazan and Chris Catania, who did an absolute wonderful job. And just wanted to remind uh, Council, this is actually the third budget uh, for a large facility uh, that we've brought in. We built two fire halls as well. We built one that was planned Queensville. Uh, one was unplanned as uh, Councillor Foster knows well, the, the burn down in Mount Albert. Both of those projects came in on budget and on time as well. And I, I point to General Manager Carmazan. When we first hired him, I recall the CAO that we hired him from the firm, uh, the, the company of Aurora, the town, said to me, you just hired the best facilities manager in Ontario. And I think Aaron's done a terrific job. And Chris Catania showed up every single day at the site and he really delivered here. So, you know, we're proud of uh, the accomplishments of Aaron and uh, Chris and we look forward to the help. I think it's going to be a big challenge, but uh, uh, this team has done a terrific job and certainly needs some kudos. So I just wanted to uh, say a little, uh, bump out to Aaron and his team. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. We certainly appreciate the team and we know it was a team that uh, team effort. I know there were a lot of people involved with it and and uh, it's certainly a building that we're all very proud of. Um, anxious to get in and have a have a look and see but but uh, the timing will work for us when it's right. So we'll we'll uh, be patient in the meantime. but congratulations and thank you so much for an excellent job on that facility. Are there any other questions or comments at this time? Seeing none, could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Crothers, Councillor Persicini, all those in favor? And that's carried. Are there any other items, uh, Mr. Carmazan, at this time? 
Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, nothing further at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions of uh, Mr. Carmerson at this time? Not seeing any, we will move along to item J and that's Community Infrastructure and Environmental Services. Mr. Molinari, would you be there for us? There you are. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. We have no reports at this time. Uh, do you have any updates for members of council? I do have a, a quick update, a, a good news story um, uh, relating to the new pollinator gardens in Riverdale Park that were installed as a butterfly way project. So the Environmental Advisory Committee collected uh, some donations from the public uh, in the amount of $335, and they matched those contributions to provide a total of $670. And also a special thanks to the Rice Group for contributing uh, towards the project as well as um, staff and volunteers that assisted to build and establish the garden. So I just wanted to uh, provide a brief overview of that for Council's information. Very good. Thank you very much. Questions, comments? Councillor Roy De Clemente. Uh, thank you. I'm just, wh where is this garden located? I'd like to go visit. It's in the Riverdale uh, Drive Park area. In Riverdale Park. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Councillor Roy DeClement, or sorry, Councillor Crothers, go ahead. Uh, specifically, they are um, located at the Little Parkette on River Street, uh, as well as um, at the uh, River Drive Park Community Centre. There's one there as well. And uh, we are looking at uh, uh, getting more gardens across the, uh, town uh, so we can become a butterfly way. Very good. Thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, any other questions or comments for Mr. Molinari? Seeing none, uh, could I have a mover and a seconder for the update, please? Councillor Crothers, Councillor Foster, all those in favour? And that's carried. Uh, item K is development services. Mr. Romuno, are you with us this evening? I'm, I've already seen you. Yes, thank you. Madam Mayor, good evening, uh, members of council. The uh, fir our first item is the uh, a report on a, a proposed settlement of a uh, LPAT appeal matter uh, related to a draft final subdivision application and a zoning bylaw application. Uh, the owners are the uh, uh, Rice Commercial Group, um, and the subject land is in uh, Mount Albert, uh, just uh, north of uh, Center Street. Uh, the purpose of this report is to inform the members of the public of the uh, of a proposed settlement regarding the uh, planning applications. Um, the proposal is to facilitate uh, 29 residential units on the subject lands. I'll just provide a brief history um, uh, with respect to the uh, application and the subject lands. Uh, the lands that are subject of the draft plan of subdivision and the zoning bylaw amendment application where lands are that are designated uh, by our official plan, the Mount Albert uh, secondary plan as low density residential dating back to the, uh, the late 1980s. Um, in the early 1990s, the, uh, that the King Street uh, neighborhood was uh, developed and registered as plan of subdivision. Um, the block 201 uh, at that time was conveyed to the uh, to the town for a future road connection to service uh, the subject lands. Uh, the owner submitted the planning applications back in 2017. Uh, we held a public meeting in 2018. Subsequent to that, the uh, both applications were appealed to the uh, LPAT, the local planning uh, uh, appeal tribunal. Uh, in late 2019, there was a case management uh, conference uh, hearing attended by uh, essentially the three parties. Uh, we were a party, the town of EG, region of York, and the Lake Simcoe uh, Region Conservation Authority. Purpose of that uh, conference to, was to identify, you know, the issues, and, there was, and, uh, and subsequent to that conference, uh, we did identify three, three, uh, three issues that required resolution um and indicated in the report the three key issues were servicing water and wastewater servicing uh, that was raised by the region access uh, to the land through the block 201 and the establishment of the de development limits and the natural heritage system um, areas areas to be protected um, following that case management hearing there was a, a mediation day and the parties uh, you know set about to 
uh, you know, come to resolution of those three items. And, uh, you know, at this point we have, and that's why we've uh, reported to council, we've sent the notice out to the area res residents, uh, uh, individual notices uh, on King Street. We've put ads in the paper and uh, on social media informing uh, the residents uh, about the uh, proposed settlement. Um, in addition to those issues, and all parties have uh, come to agreement on the resolution of those issues. We also um, had the applicant revise the original application, which contained 31 units, um, 15, 16 single detached units, sorry, 16 townhome units and 15 um, single detached units. The current plan is for a reduction, has a reduction of two units, we're down to 29 units. Um, 15 single detached on the north side of King Road and 14 townhome units to be serviced by a future a private road which will require future site plan and plan a condominium. The uh, loss of those two units enabled the increase in par visitor parking spaces um, from 8 to 24 and that's in, in addition to the on-site parking spaces within the individual uh, units. Uh, you know at this point um, the, the purpose is to uh, seek any uh, public comments uh, to date. We have received three uh, emails from residents on King Street, and I think our clerks shared those with uh, members of council this evening. Planning staff also took uh, one call from a, a resident who didn't who didn't submit an email, but uh, expressed some concerns. Uh, moving forward, the intent is to provide a. Uh, a more fulsome report with recommendations for council on a proposed settlement at our July 27th uh, hearing. We'll send out notices again, and we will also in that report summarize um, any public comments that we received. Um, and again, I just want to reiterate that the land subject to the development proposal were designated uh, as part of the Mount Albert secondary plan for low density residential use. Uh, and the proposed uh, development plan of subdivision uh, and zoning bylaw implements the uh, our current official plan. At that point, at this point, Madam Mayor, if there are any questions, I'd be glad to uh, provide some answers. Thank you. Thank you. Questions of Mr. Ramuno. Councillor Crone, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you too, Mr. Ramuno. I have a I have a few questions. So as you mentioned, this property was uh, originally zoned uh, to be developed back as far far back as 1992. Is that correct? To you, Madam Mayor. So the official plan designation goes back to uh, 89, uh, Mount Albert. 89. Secondary. Low density residential. The lands are still, we're still zoned the traditional rural zone and, and hence the reason for the uh, uh, rezoning application to implement the uh, uh, residential zoning as per the official plan and the draft plan of subdivision really at this point will just create some uh, development blocks that will require at a future uh, state uh, date uh, site plan application and a condominium application just to finalize the actual uh, uh, details of the of the development so it was considered rural up until the lpad is that is that correct so just to you, Madam Mayor, just to be clear, the official plan designates the lands as low density residential. Okay. Okay. It's the so, zoning that's still rural and, and and requires a rezoning. So I and, and I'm just I'm just trying to through you, Madam Mayor, I'm just trying to to get to the the heart of this. The the folks when they the, the back onto where this this uh, development would would be go would be going, uh, they should have been they should have known at the time that there was the possibility that something could be they should have been told that. I mean, in good conscience, somebody should have told them that uh, when purchasing their land, um, even from the original development. Is, is, is that, a fair, that, that, is that, that a fair comment? That, that's correct. Yes, those lands were, were, were always designated low density residential. Um, and that block 201 that was conveyed to the town when the uh, King Street uh, neighborhood was developed at that time was conveyed to the town from that, by that developer for future uh, uh, public road connection to service these lands. And, yeah. and that would have been registered in the uh, uh, clause in the uh, subdivision agreements that were registered back in the early 90s. Okay, and and uh, through you, Madam Mayor, to Mr. Ramuno, um, prior to 2005, the Greenbelt Act, uh, my understanding that, that in fact, they could have actually had much more 
uh, 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 dwellings, uh, more houses placed in there than there actually is today. Is that is that correct? You, Madam Mayor, just just to be clear, the so if 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 I can direct the uh, council to, I guess it's attachment. Um, best attachment to look at is attachment uh, appendix one, the location map. So the uh, so the area in yellow is really the area subject to the uh, the future 29 units, um, and that is the area that is within the uh, secondary plan designated for residential. The limits of the secondary plan lands to the north are now under the green belt prior to the green belt coming into play into existence in 06 or 05, 2005. Those lands would have been part of the, of the rural area. But currently under the green belt, the lands to the north uh, of that dashed green line uh, cannot be developed. Some of those land, those lands are still under the ownership of the uh, rice group. Uh, some of those lands are uh, uh, will be protected because uh, they contain environmental features. As you can see on either side, the wood lots and the uh, uh, part of the land is a part of a wetland. And the area that is, uh, you can tell by the air photo, is been has been uh, plowed and is uh, used for agricultural. But again, under the green belt, there's no development allowed uh, beyond these the this last remnant parcel of the 29 units. Okay, but uh, okay, uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Conceivably, though, prior to Greenbelt, they could have applied for an application and gone to town on uh, that extra land. Okay, um, uh, okay. So, and then the other thing, you know, you know, I think this was in some of the the correspondence that we received. There were concerns um, around servicing. So, my understanding, Madam, through you, Madam Mayor, is that we don't. We don't have the proper, even if we approve this thing, let's for argument's sake, approved it tomorrow. We don't have the allocation for these for these folks to really initiate something. Is that correct? Through you, Madam Mayor, that, that's correct. Part of the uh, uh, proposed settlement is uh, the zoning uh, to establish the residential zoning would be subject to a condition of a holding provision until the uh, wastewater servicing has been uh, identified by the uh, by the region of York. Uh, we do mention in a report that uh, through a commitment from the various landowners um, in the community, the region of York is conducting a, uh, a review of the existing uh, uh, wastewater facility to determine uh, if there's additional uh, capacity. Only at that time will then the HB uh, be allowed to be lifted and uh, they, the applicant could then proceed to the next step being a site plan to just finalize the details of the development and then you know issue, uh, you know, apply for building permits. But that is still, uh, we won't know the results of that until uh, later on this year. Okay, so so for you, Madam Mayor, there, there, we, <laughs> They may not even be able to have the allocation to, to proceed. Uh, we don't know. So there's there's still a, a big question mark there. Okay, and, and sorry for, for uh, taking all the time. Uh, but through you, Madam Mayor, my last question is just just help me, take me through the process. If we decided as a council today to uh, just decline this and and not go forward, what, what would, with LPAT, what would be the likely response from the applicant? How would they, and I know I appreciate you don't have a crystal ball, but I'd be very curious to know what you think the the outcome would be would be if if we decided not to approve it. Where do you think this would go? Do you, Madam Mayor? Okay, so, uh, so the applicant, I mean, their recourse would then to be to uh, proceed to a uh, a full LPAD hearing as opposed to a settlement hearing, and it would be a contested hearing. Uh, at that point, then, if council makes the decision not to, you know, support a uh, the development or the proposed settlement, it would be a contested hearing, and and uh, the, if the municipality chooses then to argue against the application, that would be a full hearing and would have to provide the uh, appropriate evidence at a future hearing. But our, if I'm if I'm to understand correctly, our position would not be terribly strong because it's a, it's zoned and it's allowed use, yeah, so we're not correct. really standing on. Yeah, we're, the we're land, the land's on very strong ground. That's true. The three matter made the lands have been designated, and we're always contemplated for residential development dating back to the uh, uh, late '80s. Um, the, at the time of that King Street uh, neighborhood being developed, 
that block two or one, which will serve as the access road, was conveyed to the town for a future uh, a road connection. So it was contemplated, always contemplated for future development. And, and uh, sorry, just one last question. Um, the, the Lake Simcoe Con Region Conservation Authority, what's their, their position on this? Do you, Madam Mayor? So the Conservation Authority was a, a party. Uh, they've they've essentially signed off on the uh, on a proposed development, uh, agreed to a proposed settlement. They've already provided their conditions of draft plan approval. The development limits have been set. Um, there are some additional studies that the uh, um, applicant would have to finalize in proceeding to clearing those conditions at a future date. But the Conservation Authority has provided their uh, sign off on the proposed development, being the 29 units uh, as a current plan has been submitted. All right. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. No further questions. Other questions, comments? If I may, Madam Mayor. Go, go ahead, Councillor Morton. Um, thank you. Through you to uh, Mr. Romano um, and to uh, Councillor uh, Crone, I believe that this goes right back to the Gladys Rolling days um, when uh, she was there and sitting where we are sitting now and um because that's uh that was when a lot of the information was um, made for that area so i have a feeling that uh if they dug back really really many 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 years if we still have that information we would find it so just to let mr romana know that thank you Any other questions or comments? I guess I just have one question, uh, and it would be in regard to those people that actually back on to the property that's being developed. How would they uh, obtain information on that uh, over the years? Would it have been when they moved in? Uh, I'm thinking about people that have a resale. Um, those. I, I know it's a long time uh, ago that it was uh, that it was set up, but how would these um, residents know that that there w was a contemplation at this point of of building uh, a number of houses behind them? Through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so yeah, it does go back a long time, back to the uh, early '90s, '92, when that uh, King Street subdivision was registered. At that time. I mean, uh, I haven't seen any of the uh, sales plans uh, that were that may have been available at that time, uh, but our official plan certainly would have indicated that that entire area would have been low density residential. And within the subdivision agreements that are registered on title, there would have been reference to that block 201 that was set aside and, and conveyed at that time by that original developer to the town for a future public roadway into those lands to the north. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, and I, uh, for those that are, are listening tonight, we are not making any decision tonight. We are receiving information and uh, the vote that we will ha have is to, to receive the information. There will be a final staff recommendation come back to our council on July the 27th and uh, at a council meeting. And I understand that until such time as we're back here on the 27th of July, those that have um, comments and, and uh, letters that want to send into to us, uh, they will be uh, presented at that time on July the 27th. So any uh, anybody listening that would like to express their opinions, then we certainly will be uh, available to read them at that point, uh, if not before, but we will deal with them on the 27th of July. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions or comments at this time. Uh, I have a motion, be it resolved, that Development Services Planning Branch report P2021-21 dated June 15th to 2021 regarding the proposed settlement of the local planning appeal tribunal LPAT appeal for the draft plan of subdivision application 19 T7 17003 and zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA 1706 be received and that a final staff recommendation report be brought back 
to uh, July 27th, 2021 council meeting for consideration. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Moved. moved by Councillor Persicini, seconded by Councillor Crone. Thank you. All those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you very much. Item number two is Development Services Memo, Social Services Relief Fund 18838 Highway 11. Mr. Romuno, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So this this memo is really, a, a, I think, just a good news uh, advisement for, for council and the community. Uh, staff have been working with uh, uh, York Region staff from their housing, uh, housing division um, as part of their uh, York Region's new rapid housing projects uh, to support vulnerable residents who require uh, transitional housing. Uh, the region selected the, uh, um, the leader place uh, uh, Porter Place uh, site on Young Street, west side of Young Street, uh, and their plans are, and uh, they're working with staff on finalizing the site plan and finalizing building permit drawings for a, an additional uh, 18 units of transitional housing on that location, uh, just to the north uh, of the existing two buildings, being the uh, Leader Place and the Porter Place, which combined uh, uh, contain approximately 40, 40 units and some 29 parking spaces. Uh, so this proposal will add 18 units of uh, much needed transitional housing. And the uh, the region is scheduling and they've got a great team together. We've been working with them uh, and they're hoping to uh, uh, have their billing permits pulled uh, this summer and it's module uh, prefabricated construction and they're scheduling a completion date of uh, the end of 2021 with uh, occupancy by early 2022. So. Great news. Thank you. Very good news. Councillor Foster and I have been involved with the meetings and uh, it's very exciting for us. It's a terrific place. Uh, it's all modular. It's built inside and they it arrives and it's up within a few days and then they finish the inside following and and uh, that's uh, wonderful for for our residents and, and other residents that are looking for affordable housing. So we're able to uh, host them there. And I think that's uh, it, it's very good news for, for East Willenberry. Any questions on this item at all? I'm not seeing any. Councillor Foster, would you move this please? And seconded by Councillor Persicini. All those in favor? And that's carried. Mr. Ramuto, do you have anything else for us this evening? Nothing further from Development Services, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Any questions of Mr. Ramuno? Seeing none, we'll move on to item L and uh, with finance. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council. Um, so uh, all municipalities are uh, required to publish uh, financial statements and these financial statements uh, include mandatory reporting, um, which can be very hard to, uh, to interpret if you're a non-financial person. So since 2018's uh, year end, uh, we have produced uh, what we call an annual report, which not only um, has these financial statements in them, but has uh, additional statistics and information and explanations to help uh, the reader understand uh, the, the town's financial position through each year. So um, we're happy to report that for the second year in a row, we've been recognized by the um, Government Financial Officers Association, and we've been awarded the uh, Canadian Award for Excellence in Financial Reporting, which is um, a, it's a, fairly, it's a very uh, significant achievement for uh, financial reporting. And I would like to thank the team that um, put this together, which includes uh, uh, Laura Hanna and her communications uh, team, uh, Carolyn Brown, who's the manager of development finance, and a particular thanks to uh, Val Adima, who's our uh, director of finance, who led the initiative and coordinated uh, all the inputs towards uh, um, getting this uh, to a position where we were able to achieve an award. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. Well, please share our congratulations with all of the staff. It it certainly sounds like it was a, a team effort and uh, it was very successful. Uh, questions at this time? 
a very complete report. I'm not seeing any questions. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Crothers, Councillor Roy DiClemente, all those in favour? And that's carried. Do we have any other business at this time? Uh, none at this time, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Any questions at all? I'm not seeing any. Thank you very much. We'll move on to administration item M. Would you Mr. like me? Would you yes. like me to kick this off, Madam Mayor? Please. I wasn't sure whether your mic was working or not. So, no, yes, it, please. It is uh, actually working now. So, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, very important report and matter before us today. Um, we've waited seven years since 2014 for the provincial government to uh, make any action or decision on the. Uh, Upper York Sewage System Environmental Assessment. Um, this environmental assessment was undertaken in 2010. It uh, was a three year, over $30 million process, which introduced a state of the art water reclamation center, innovation, and improvements to the Lake Simcoe watershed. The EA included broad and wide ranging consultation, including uh, the establishment of a full time office and uh, experts such as the Lake Simcoe Conservation Authority and others partaking in this. And uh, on June 4th, we finally had some action from the province. Um, they are introducing uh, a York Region Sewage Act. Um, which to summarize is very specific to this Upper York solution and introduces an expert panel. Um, we uh, took a, uh, an approach here after consultation with the region of um, we would really like to get and move forward with an approval. We have an official plan that is based on uh, significant provincially approved growth in our community and in the Northern York region and have asked for the expert panel to be uh, set aside at this time and that we allow for, most importantly, the decommissioning of our lagoons, uh, the antiquated lagoon system, and the servicing of our plan for growth. Um, the report was written very quickly. Uh, we have very, uh, had, did not have a lot of uh, response, our uh, time for responses. And July 4th is the time to uh, provide comments to the, uh, to the province. And um, tonight, Madam Mayor, we're here to table the report. Um, we would like more time, to be frank. Uh, we would like to maybe have this deferred to a special council meeting. I know you've been in consultations today with uh, uh, senior regional officials as well. And I'd like to pass it back to you, Madam Moore, uh, Madam Mayor, to uh, to uh, possibly provide some more insight into uh, how we could move forward on this important initiative. Thank you. Um, the, the report is well written. However, for members of council, there's, uh, there's uh, a lot more detail that needs to, to uh, come forward to all of us. Uh, I spoke with the chair of the uh, region, uh, Wayne Emerson, uh, this morning, and he indicated to me that he would be available if we called a special meeting next week at this time, uh, sorry, daytime, that he would be available to come and uh, give his um, account of where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. Um, I am, uh, with your permission, I will reach out to uh, our uh, Provincial Member of Parliament and see, in fact, if uh, she is available to come to this meeting as well. Uh, for the life of me, I can't understand uh, why someone would agree to something that has been sitting for 21 years. I think it's... Um, irresponsible. We are a community that is slated to grow 
and uh, we have plans in the future for, well, we've heard tonight facilities, a variety of facilities, some completed uh, this week, this month, and others that we are hoping to have uh, for our community in, in the coming um, year or so. Um, whether it's parks, whether it's uh, uh, commercial, the plan has always been for East Gwillimbury to, to be a growing community. And I'm not sure how we do our job uh, with the news that we have in front of us now. So I, I would ask if uh, there's any comments, but more importantly, I'd like to know if members of council uh, would be um, agreeable to a meeting uh, next Tuesday. And I would suggest perhaps 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, have uh, an hour and a half or so with Chair Emerson and, and um, uh, um, count, not, not counselor, MPP uh, Mulrooney. Um, and uh, hopefully we all can learn a little more about how we got here today and more importantly uh, for for all of us is how do we move forward tomorrow? Um, so just comments, questions I would take, but if, if I can have an agreement, then I certainly will be, will probably would make the call tonight to MPP Mulrooney to uh, see if we can have her as well. Um, questions, I see um, Councillor Persicini, go ahead. I think it's very, very, very important, my Mayor, that we get her and we can work around it if it's possible. I'm not going to agree with, with all my colleagues. I think it's important that she's there more than anything else because this is the problem that we need to, to convince. This, this, we cannot take this line down. This, is, this has been going on for a long, long period of time. And uh, I... Uh, I mean, I don't know what my colleagues think, and I know that what the people in the region think. I talked to a few of the people in the region, and they said we have to insist that this, you know, so make make some changes here. Anyway, that's my point. I work, I will work around whatever's. If she's not available that Tuesday, I can work around whatever she's available, and uh, and she's important to be in the meeting. My opinion. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, other. Comments, questions, Councillor Crothers, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, setting up a meeting for next week. I, I agree with Councillor Persicini. Uh, we need our MPP there as well. Um, I had trouble with, with the way the um, recommendations were coming forward, and I just want to uh, sort of lay that out. And I, I appreciate the work the staff put into this, um, but I just want, want us to take a step back. It makes it very difficult to say no to an expert panel when, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always pushing for us to be evidence-based decision-making. And I, I, I believe that it's not so much the panel as the time delay. It's the time delay that that is the problem. And I think that, that rather than asking the province not to move forward with the bill, that we're, we talk specifically about what our concerns are with the bill, that striking this expert panel will delay things and what that means to us. Um, I also um, think that we can do a better job talking about the lagoons because uh, we've really gone out of our way as a council to put forward recommendations and, and we have reports that, that ask for the decommissioning of the lagoons to be considered separate from the Upper York. Um, and now we're tying them back together again. And I think, think that's wrong because I think we, it, it's important that those uh, lagoons get decommissioned and I would like that to be in, in the report. Um, that goes forward that we talk about decommissioning the lagoons separate from this, because if this expert panel goes through and things are delayed, we can't delay the de decommissioning of those lagoons. So I don't want those tied. Um, I also think that it's important to, to talk about uh, meeting our development targets, that uh, if, if there is a delay, then, then they need to be changing those development targets. And I think that that's something that, that we can put forward. So I, I guess I'm just looking at this, this report and trying to think about it the other way around, rather than saying not passing the bill, which I, I doubt we would get much traction on when the government has, has put this bill forward, but instead say, here's where our concerns lie. And to me, it's, it's four things. It's a delay, it's the lagoons, 
it's our development targets and it's the hundred million dollars that's already invested in this. So, so I would like uh, when the report comes back to be more focused on those uh, rather than uh, the goal of, of getting them not to move forward with the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Roy de Clemente, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think this um, this government has shown uh, a willingness to listen when there's uh, when there's something that doesn't make sense uh, and there's a hue and cry from the public and there's pushback from the public. They they have demonstrated a willingness to to pivot and and change direction, whether or not we agree with that. That's what they have done in the past, and so I think that we are right. Uh, if we don't think that Bill um, 306 is the right uh, is the right direction for our community and for York Region, then we are right to uh, to stand up and say so. And quite frankly, uh, an expert panel, if it was needed, was needed seven years ago, not in 2021. And and uh, I have a hundred million reasons why it's a bad idea. Quite frankly, and that's uh, and that's that we've already spent that kind of money, and uh, that was that was done with the expectation that uh, we were we were going to be provided with the infrastructure to support the growth that was handed to us by the province. So go build your highway, uh, but give us the pipe as well because we can't meet your targets otherwise. So uh, and yes, I'm available next Tuesday. Thanks. Thank you very much. Other. Questions, comments, Councillor Crohn, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I just uh, like to stick for the record. I'm happy to meet uh, next Tuesday uh, morning to uh, discuss this. I think it needs a little more uh, refinement and uh, nuance in how we approach it. So I definitely support uh, having a separate meeting uh, to discuss this very important issue. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? And I'm I'm in yes, too, Madam Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Morton. I'm okay on next Tuesday as well. Thank you. I think we have everyone that's available next Tuesday. Uh, I, I had suggested uh, earlier 10 a.m. Um, with the hopes that, uh, that uh, Caroline Mulrooney will be available, our MPP, as well as uh, I do know that the chair of the region has already committed that time as well if if in fact we wanted him to to uh, participate and I think it's very important I know that uh, this is this is a regional project uh, and that has been in on place for for a long time and uh, I know that within the last three or four years the, the region and particularly the chair of the region has been involved with many many meetings uh, regarding this um, infrastructure with the with the belief that it was uh, only a step around the corner to be to be completed. So he certainly can offer us the the kind of work that he has done behind the scenes, um, and and the disappointment uh, that that he has uh, mirrors what what we're talking about tonight as well. Um, so with that, uh, we have a. A motion in front of us. Uh, it is very lengthy. Um, I guess my first question would be: Do we have a mover and seconder for this in its uh, entirety, with perhaps some modifications? I'm not seeing. Anyone, uh, Councillor Roy de Clemente, go ahead, please. I'll take a stab at it. I think we need a okay. little bit of massaging. And I'd Thank like you. to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, I think we want to receive the report. And uh, that we, uh, I think Clause 3 also covers what we'd like to do, that on behalf of Council, the Mayor request a meeting with senior provincial, provincial elected officials, the York Region Chair and Mayors of, in, of impacted municipalities. We didn't cover that off, so we should probably talk about that piece. Um, and uh, I think that's really what we want to do to be for a special meeting to be held next Tuesday at, at 10 a.m. And then just leave the rest of it until we've we've had a chance to uh, to figure this out. Obviously, time is of the essence because the bill remains on the environmental bill of, of rights until July 4th for comment. So we do need to act as quickly as possible. So I think we just want to receive it and request a meeting for next Tuesday. The yes. end. 
I don't think we need the other mayors, but we could certainly let them know that we're having the meeting and invite them to watch our YouTube stream. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's uh, probably more productive. Thank you. So you're going to move that. Uh, Councillor Crothers, go ahead, please. Do we have any insight into why this is coming forward? Because I think understanding what the provincial government's trying to accomplish with this helps us in looking for a solution. Uh, I have heard a variety of um, points from the region. However, I would hope that Chair Emerson will give us the why at the regional end to understand it, uh, rather than I paraphrase it at this point. Okay, thank you. Okay. So I have a mover. Do I have a seconder for this motion? Councilor Persichini. Okay, uh, all in favor? And that's carried. Thank you. Um, I will uh, endeavor to have a notification before noon tomorrow. Um, uh, certainly we do have a confirmation from from Chair Emerson, but uh, I will work with our uh, MPP's office and, um, and, and hopefully she is available as well. Um, I'm moving on to item N. I'm just wondering, is there, are there any other uh, items under administration? before I move on to uh, emergency and community safety services. I'm not seeing any, so we'll move on to item N, emergency and community safety services. Uh, we have no reports at this time. Chief, there you are. Thank you. Uh, do you have anything verbal to share with us at this time? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. You're right, uh, nothing on the agenda tonight, but I did want to say thank you for uh, highlighting Rihanna's uh, artwork on the junior firefighter program. We're, we're thrilled that we came in uh, three out of nine. It's always exciting to see that our work. So I, I appreciate that you uh, gave it some face time. Other than that, I'm uh, ready to take any questions. Thank you. Questions of the chief? I don't have a question. I have a comment. Uh, apparently, uh, we have people out knocking on doors, checking, checking um, uh, smoke alarms. And uh, the word is out there in the community that uh, that they're very friendly, they're very uh, informant, and uh, and they're very keen on on meeting with our residents, and the residents are keen on having them there. So, please pass along our sincere thank you. Uh, we know that uh, even if they have one one smoke alarm that wasn't working, that they leave and have it repaired, that we've got a safer community. So, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Any questions of the chief? Not seeing any. We will move along to the adoption of the minutes and let me pull these up here. Um, item O, to adopt the council minutes from the meeting held on June 1st, 2021, and that's page 167 to 180. Uh, be it resolved that council adopt the council minutes from the meeting held on June 1st, 2021. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Persicini, Councillor Foster, all those in favor? And that's carried. Item P is correspondence. And we have uh, the correspondence from our bride-to-be, uh, and that has all already been dealt with. Yes. So we uh, will move along to the second item, and that is from KNC Broughton, uh, Keating and McDonald, and Elliot and Nickloff regarding 19658 Center Street. And that's regarding the item that we have uh, under uh, development services that we spoke about earlier. And this is to receive their comments um, that they have sent to us. I have a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Persicini, Councillor Morton. Yes, so moved. Thank you, all those in favor. And that's carried. Uh, item Q, there are no reports at this time. Item R, resolutions, none at this time. We have uh, two bylaws. 
at this time. Uh, number one is a bylaw being a bylaw to appoint a property standards officer, a municipal law enforcement officer for the corporation of the town of East Goulombary. And the second one is a bylaw 2021 being a bylaw to appoint an accessibility advisory committee uh, for the corporation of the town of East Goulombary. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Persuccini, Councillor Crone. All those in favor? That's carried. We have other business. Uh, the first one is Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee uh, regarding uh, a land acknowledgement to be used at significant events in the town of East Gwellenberry. Uh, any questions or comments on that? I, I know that the Diversity and Inclusivity uh, Advisory Committee are working on this. I'm wondering, um, I would like to know how many other communities have uh, some type of a land uh, acknowledgement that they use on a regular basis and how did they come about uh, having that? I think it's important to, to know whether it was, whether it came from um, the uh, their community or a committee or something that they have seen and uh, adopted that is used in another area. Um, I think I, I, I just like to know um, it's an area that we're not in and I want to, I, I would hope that we, we do it the right way the first time. So um, I'm not sure who, who would have that, information. Councillor Crothers, you're the uh, on the advisory committee. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, we have Lena Singh, the chair of our committee here uh, to take us through this report from the committee and Michelle Collette. Uh, the two of them have, uh, I believe, collaborated today uh, to talk about uh, this report and to, to take us through it. And hopefully uh, that those questions can be answered as we go. Great. Uh, so thank you. Turn it over to Michelle Collette. Good, good evening, Madam Mayor and good councillors. Evening. Uh, good evening. Yes, nice to see everyone. I will, uh, Lena Singh's actually going to take us through it. She and I spoke today and she's ready to um, give the highlight overview of the report and answer any questions. And I'm here as well as the staff liaison. Lena, I'll, ta I'll pass it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Good evening, Madam Mayor. Good evening, uh, councillors. Thank you for the opportunity to um, bring the thoughts and the, the thinking of the of the act to council. So regarding the land acknowledgement, I know the mayor had reached out to DIAC, um, and in fact, DIAC from the very inception had considered the use of a land acknowledgement at the town of East Willembury. On personal reflection, we did a lot of soul searching, a lot of reflection and through personal work um, from members of the committee we've realized that the land acknowledgement is a significant step um, and it's an opportunity to build relationships with Indigenous peoples. And it can be a, that significant step that I spoke of towards truth and reconciliation. And in moving forward with any initiative that has an impact on communities, it is always wise to consult with those communities before we do anything because Whatever, as the mayor said, whatever we do, we want to make sure it's right. We want to make sure it's respectful. We want to make sure it's authentic. We want to make sure we are moving on the, on the on a path that ha that is meaningful. And we do not want to be accused of tokenism. We don't want to be checking off a box. So we haven't done a land acknowledgement yet. And if we are going to be doing one, it should be for all of the right reasons, and it should be done in all of the right ways. To that point, um, we also believe that a land acknowledgement um, is not necessarily a document that is written once and remains static. It is a living document. It can change. A land acknowledgement that is used in different situations can change for those situations. And so that is why it is the recommendation of the committee that we do start a dialogue with the Indigenous community, the Indigenous peoples, and we feel that it will be respectful if that... Uh, request to start the dialogue came from the mayor to Chief Big Canoe, leader to leader, because that would imply that the town of East Fulhambury respects this community and is committed 
to moving forward towards voter reconciliation in a meaningful way. The committee is happy to continue that dialogue because we realize that dialogue, whatever we are hoping to accomplish, is not going to be accomplished with just one conversation. It's going to be ongoing. But if the mayor were to start that dialogue with the chief um, to help us move along the way in terms of how the land acknowledgement is to be to, is to come about, when it is going to be used, where it is going to be used, how to make it meaningful, and how to ensure that the land acknowledgement is not the only thing that the town of East Columbia is going to do to move towards reconciliation and a relationship with the indigenous people. We need to do something that is meaningful. The land acknowledgement is one part, but we need to educate ourselves. We need to make a commitment to work together with them in a collaborative manner. And, you know, the recent findings in the 215 in Kamloops, it was um, it was traumatizing for many members of the committee. And we were not members, we are not members of the indigenous community. So for those members, I can't, can't imagine how hard it is for them to continue to be traumatized. There is a history of trauma there, but that trauma continues to this day. So we feel it is extremely important that we approach this very carefully and that we are very respectful and collaborative and that we reach out to the indigenous communities to help us walk this path in a way that it's meaningful to everyone. Thank you, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Questions Thank of you, Lena. Great. Madam Mayor, if I could uh, go ahead. I just want to thank Anna. Uh, th thank you, Lena, and thank you for waiting. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, talk, let council know that the expertise on this committee uh, is really something else. They, we have been able to bring uh, together a group that has a lot of experience uh, with issues such as this. And uh, one of the comments that really resonated with me is that um, it's a little bit like the climate emergency declaration. But if you make that declaration without doing the background work, it's just checking a box. It's just it, it's empty. And same with doing a land acknowledgement without doing the background work of finding out about the land, of reaching out to the people that you want to show the respect to. Uh, again, it's checking a box and it's empty. So the the committee spent a long time. They've been working on this for a number of months. This isn't just um, in reaction to the the 215. This is um, something that they've been working on for a long time. And uh, we pulled together all the information uh, that that uh, different members of the committee had from from their areas of expertise and put together uh, a, a path forward uh, that uh, staff can work with um, to uh, proceed through that on that learning journey uh, so we can all be more informed. And uh, the end result would hopefully be a land acknowledgement um, that we could be using at our uh, at our council meetings and the farmers market and those type of things. But as Lena says, it's not static. It continues to change with our learning. Um, <clears throat> the land acknowledgement that I used uh, years ago as chair of the board uh, is different than the land acknowledgement I would use today because my learning um, has changed as well. So uh, to Lena's point, this is this is an ongoing process that the diversity committee is uh, happy to help with. Uh, but the rec recommendations uh, before you um, are to turn this over to staff uh, to develop the strategy and the timeline uh, for how this can unfold. And we talked with both Mita and, and Michelle, uh, who are happy to uh, be taking on uh, that work toward on this journey. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Crone, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for you to uh, to, uh, to to Lena Singh. Uh, thank you for you and your committee for all your hard work that you've done on this. And I think it's important that we we reinforce the notion that that you began this work a long time ago, and this is not a, a reaction to the the tragic events involving the Indigenous uh, schools that we're all uh, shocked over and, and disappointed. Uh, I, I think I think doing the land acknowledgement is a really important step that we can take towards reconciliation uh, because it, it pays respect to to in in, in, in indigenous ancestral uh, heritage because this, there's a lot of history that goes back in with it, with this and their own diplomatic um, uh, uh, processes because if if a, if a member from another tribe came onto the territory of another indigenous tribe they would acknowledge 
their 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 land and say that I'm, um, you know, even if they're pass- passing through, I, I acknowledge that I am the lawn, land of the traditional territory of, you know, whatever tribe it was, and um, and, and showing respect and, and letting them know that they come in peace. And I think if ever there's a time that we need to show uh, our indigenous community that we are peaceful, that now is the time. So I'm I'm really glad about the work that you've you've done on this. Um, you, you know, we, we want to make sure that it's as you said, not ticking a box and it's not tokenism. That that there's sincerity to it. So uh, I'm really happy uh, for your work on this, and thank you so much for for everything that you're doing. Thank, thank you, you Councillor Cohn. Thank you, Councillor Brody Clemente. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think uh, I think this is an important step uh, that we need to take, and and I, um, I I acknowledge that this is a learning journey for pretty much everybody involved because we don't we don't have personal um, connection, if you know, and we're we're not uh, we're not uh, part of that group. Um, to count, to uh, Mayor Haxon's point, I do also want to hear more about how other municipalities are handling it. Obviously, we're not the first and we're not the closest uh, to some of these issues. Uh, and uh, for me as well, what I'd also like to have a better understanding of is some clarity on uh, when it's to be used and how it's to be used. Um, because I think if you just do it all the time, it's it's not, it doesn't, it loses its meaning and its impact. And so uh, we want to make sure that what what we say has meaning and, and, and retains its impact. Um, Madam Mayor, I seem to recall at the farmer's market ribbon cutting that you did do a form of a land acknowledgement. Have you all, I'm assuming that you've already done some work on this on your own. I, I know you've, you've got uh, some experience in working one-on-one with, uh, with uh, Chief Big Canoe uh, through your work at the Conservation Authority. So I'm assuming you've already done some of this of your own, I guess we'll call it your own journey. Is, is that the case? Yes. Yes. I, um, I, I took uh, in university um, several courses on Indigenous uh, studies uh, when I was taking my teaching degree, and uh, it's, it's stayed with me. Um, I, I had a presentation where I invited uh, a guest to come in and speak to the class, and um, it has stayed with me. And so uh, I do work with uh, Chief Big Canoe uh, from time to time, depending on the issues. Uh, We certainly are friendly. And uh, I I welcome the opportunity to sit with her and and talk to her about uh, what we have in mind and what she would have in her mind for us. I think that's... Uh, an important uh, start, and then we'll get back to it. I don't think it's going to happen overnight, but I am um, quite pleased to take this project on um, on behalf of Council. So, Thank you, Madam Mayor. Are there other questions, comments? Just a comment, Madam Mayor, if I may. Yes, go ahead, Councillor Morton. Um, one of the things that, that uh, I learned many years ago when I joined the Legion was the fact that many of our Indigenous people fought during both of the World Wars, and, not, mm-hmm. and many of them did not come home. And, uh, and yet they all stood up to, uh, to pr- um, protect us as well and, and other people. And I think that we have to show them um, how we feel about what they did for us as well. Thank you. Um, could I have a mover and a seconder for uh, going, Councillor Crothers and Councillor Crone? All those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you very much. Uh, our confirming bylaw. I have a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Persicini, Councillor Crone, all those in favor? And that's carried, and our adjournment is at 9.22. Not a record, but getting close, I think. Um, mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Foster, so Councillor Persicini, all those in favor, and that's carried. Thank you very much. Um, have a good evening. And uh, I will keep you informed of our meeting next uh, 
a week today. I'll keep you all informed of, of our, um, our guests. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Take care.